Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for February 22nd. Uh, nice to see everybody, and I share with you the wish that we could all be at the Bruins game this evening, both to see them win and to see uh, Officer Michael Hogan, who's being honored tonight at the Bruins game. Uh, and we're very proud of him and all of our uh, officers and uh, police and fire as well. So uh, tonight we're going to start with, we have a proclamation for what's called White Ribbon Day. And to explain a little bit about that is one of our ambassadors for White Ribbon Day, Mr. Joe Curo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm very proud of this board that we, we do uh, take this up um, each year. Um, White Ribbon Day, as uh, you all know, is uh, part of the men's initiative uh, for Jane Doe, Inc., which is an organization which um, battles against uh, the problem of uh, the scourge of uh, domestic violence. Uh, this was originally brought to my attention by um, Arlington resident uh, Kim K. Holt and uh, also former uh, resident uh, Craig Norberg Bohm, who was the executive director of the men's initiative. And um, <clears throat> the intent of uh, the program is to really raise awareness that domestic violence is not um, a women's issue, strictly. It's, it's an issue uh, around which men also have to uh, be ready to raise their voices and, um, and uh, to combat. So we do you know, try around the state to uh, mark this day in, in a special way. This particular year, I have to say it has special significance for me, March 3rd is uh, my, my daughter's uh, birthday, and I think that uh, all of us who have uh, you know, daughters, wives, mothers, sisters, uh, friends, we, we understand that we uh, never want um, them to be the, the victims of uh, such, such harm. And so uh, uh, on behalf of them, I'm, I'm really happy to join uh, other ambassadors, such as some familiar faces, such as in Bedford, our uh, Arlington's own uh, Chief Bobby Bongiorno is the ambassador in Bedford, I know. I'm happy to join with them and uh, to uh, offer the uh, proclamation which you uh, have before you. Thank you very much, Joe. And we have a very, very special guest who will be receiving this proclamation. He is uh, co-chair of the state effort, uh, Sheriff Peter Katusian, and I'll introduce him to you in a moment. But first, let me read this proclamation. Uh, those of you who might be new to a selectman's meeting uh, should know that I do what are called public proclamations. These proclamations literally stem back from, stem back from uh, really England and pre-colonial days here when a board of selectmen or any um, town city agency would uh, meet and, uh, and pass or enact new laws, uh, the next day in the square the town crier would read the proclamation. So there's a lot of whereases and now therefore. Your part is to do the whereases and I'll take care of the now therefores. So when I point at you, I need you all nice and loud voice to say, Whereas. Here we go. Whereas. I meant in a loud voice. <laughs> I need you all. Here we go. Whereas. There you go. The impacts of domestic violence reach many segments of our community, regardless of gender, identity, age, race, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, or disability, and Whereas. the particularly pressing problem of violence against women, Sexual assault and domestic violence is recognized by both women and men in our community as a matter of deep concern and Whereas. the town of Arlington, our community safety and health and human services professionals and our residents have exercised leadership in raising awareness about domestic violence, encouraging all of us to be upstanders, supporting survivors and holding offenders accountable and the White Ribbon Campaign was started in Canada in 1991 to urge men to speak out in opposition to violence against women. The White Ribbon Campaign has spread to 60 countries and garnered 5 million signatures of support from concerned men. The White Ribbon Day Pledge states, from this day forward, I promise to be a part of the solution in ending violence against women and all gender-based violence. Don't lose my strength now. The White Ribbon Campaign has been endorsed by public officials and leaders in law enforcement, business, education, health care, and athletics from throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a means of supporting a comprehensive approach to domestic violence. Now, therefore, be it resolved 
that the Board of Selectmen do hereby express support for efforts both local and beyond to combat the scourge of violence against women and be it further resolved that March 3rd, 2016 is proclaimed as White Ribbon Day in the town of Arlington and that all residents are encouraged to pay fitting observance thereof and be it further and finally resolved that white ribbons along with a copy of the White Ribbon Day Pledge will be available in the Selectman's office during the week of White Ribbon Day for all municipal officials, employees, and members of the public who wish to express visible support. Signed by all of the members of this Board of Selectmen. To receive this, please welcome Sheriff Peter Katusian, Sheriff of Middlesex County. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to Selectman Dunn, Selectman Curl, Selectman Byrne for your support. Uh, this is a very special day. And uh, whereas, I, <laughs> by the way, for those of you that are familiar with resolutions, that's the best way you can do a resolution when you have <laughs> audience participation. So I always commend you, Mr. Chairman, on the way you do that. Um, I've been part of the White Ribbon uh, campaign for the nine years it's been in existence in a statewide form here in Massachusetts. I was involved in it. Uh, some of you from the State House might remember me starting Men Uniting Against Domestic Violence in the State House, calling on men to stand up against domestic violence, which was previously thought always to be a woman's problem. Uh, and that is certainly not the case. For those uh, that are unfamiliar with the White Ribbon Day, the proclamation uh, says it all. But one thing that it does not mention is that Massachusetts is the very first state in the country to have a statewide campaign for the White Ribbon Day. In a world where, there, where no community is free from gender-based violence, including Arlington, the poor communities, the more Tony communities in Middlesex County across this state and across this nation, I think it says something about our commitment here in Massachusetts to addressing this problem and changing the culture. I think it says something very special about the Arlington as well, uh, because you have taken time to formally resolve to support the White Ribbon Campaign. I came to this issue as a prosecutor. I'll just tell you very briefly. I know you've got a long evening before you. My co-chair is Thaddeus Miles, a gentleman living in Lowell now, working out of Boston. Uh, we, come, we came to the issue of uh, domestic violence in two different, very different routes. Thaddeus uh, saw it in his own home. He saw it in his own family. Uh, he had to learn about it the hard way. I learned about it when I became a prosecutor in the Middlesex District Attorney's Office. I learned about it the way that, you know, no one should ever have to learn about it, but <clears throat> I didn't ever have to see it in my own home. My mom and dad had a good relationship, but I knew that there was something very wrong about this gender-based violence, and so I became a leader in the State House and continue to lead as sheriff. As co-chair, I'm committed not only to talking about the important role we have as men, as fathers, as sons, as brothers and friends, and also as mentors in ending violence against women, but to be modeling what I believe is positive masculinity, because a man's strength is, should never be shown through, it should be thro shown through his character and his moral judgment, never through the use of force and violence. And lastly, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman and the Board of Selectmen, I'd like to invite all of you to join us for the statewide White Ribbon Day event on March 3rd at the State House on Mar at 1 p.m. in the State House's Gardner Auditorium. And once again, to the Board of Selectmen uh, and to all the members of Arlington, thank you very much for embracing <clears throat> White Ribbon Day and speaking out loudly and strongly that gender-based violence is never acceptable anywhere in this country, in this Commonwealth, in this country, or in this world. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> And uh, Sheriff, just while we have you here, uh, he's a longtime friend of Arlington, and he, uh, his, uh, his three children attend St. Agnes School. But we have a pretty big event here in Arlington uh, that you're the sponsor of this Wednesday, sir. What, what's going on? Uh, we, have, uh, we have chosen Arlington. We're having our uh, 39th Basic Training Academy graduation. We have chosen your beautiful town hall here today. We're really excited about it. It's going to be a great day. Uh, your chairman will be uh, giving us uh, uh, greetings. Our keynote speaker is Chief Ryan. Uh, and by the way, you should be very proud of your chief of police. He is a pretty amazing man. I've seen him in, in, in so many different venues, uh, and he is an incredible leader. And you should be very proud that you have him here, because I consider you lucky to have such a great chief of police. Uh, we're graduating in about 40 or 45 uh, recruits. It's going to be a great day, and we're really pleased to be enjoying such a great day right here in Arlington. So thank, thank you, you very once much, again. Sheriff. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. We'll thank see you on John. Wednesday. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for your participation in that. We really appreciate it. Next item is our what's called the consent agenda. Uh, first, we have reappointments to the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum, the Board of Trustees, Sarah Burks and Amy Taberner. 
Then we have appointments of new election workers. Susan Bernhard, 30 Eustace Street for Precinct 18. Anthony Cella, 151 Mystic Street for Precinct 1. Carol Curcio, 7 Newport Street for Precinct 21. Carol DeVito, 42 Columbia Road for Precinct 21. And Alice Ronchetti of 33 Magnolia Street also for Precinct 1. Uh, are any of those individuals in attendance here? They don't have to be, but uh, I'm sure they're among the millions watching at home. Uh, can I have a motion on the move approval? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Uh, next, we have a public hearing uh, for the uh, CDBG grants. And first, we're going to have a performance update for program year 2015 and 2016. And a big welcome, if you would, please, for our new Director of uh, Planning and Community Development. Please welcome Jennifer Raitt. Jennifer, Thank nice you. to have you. Thank you for the welcome again. Um, I'm Jennifer Raitt. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. And actually, we, are, we have been uh, going through a little bit of a staff transition, as you know. And Ted Fields, uh, has been our economic development planner, has actually been taking on the role of community development block grant administration, and will be uh, sharing the presentation this evening on both items for the agenda. Okay. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Okay, so Ted. Thank you, Jen. Ted, welcome, nice to see you as always. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and the board. It is my pleasure to uh, discuss with you the town's community development block grant program tonight. As you well know, uh, the town has a long history of supporting the CDBG program. It's entering its 41st year this year of uh, helping needy residents uh, by funding a range of uh, projects from social service programs to road reconstructions, uh, uh, ADA curb cuts, um, and uh, housing uh, development projects. So without further ado, we have a number of uh, subrecipients, as we call them, people who receive block grant funds from the community. Um, and they are here to talk about their uh, programs and their operations in 2015, 2016, if you uh, would be willing to uh, receive uh, their uh, testimony. Of course. Um, so. Uh, and uh, I wonder, do they also want to, at the same time, are they making requests for 2016? Yes, they are. Uh, with, um, as you know, both. this. Is that this, all right with the board? Yep. Uh, we can right certainly there, do both. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ted. Excellent. So please, call them. Who's up? All right. Who would like to? Yes. Mary. Sure. Success. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah. Whereas. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I do want to just talk about that white ribbon. Uh, last year, Operation Success ran a white ribbon night uh, down at the manor. And we had the male volunteers down there as well as the Arlington police. And we had 16 young, um, young clients, kids that were part of it. And they spent two hours um, that night talking about abuse that they have um, seen. Um, abuse that they have heard about. We did um, a program that ran about two hours that night, and all the young gentlemen left with white ribbons that they made for their families and for the other members of Operation Success. So I do want to say that um, it was a very, um, it was a real meaningful night for the, um, for the kids from Operation Success. Um, last year was very successful. We're going into our 19th year a volunteer and um, down at Monotomy Manor. We are requesting this year our usual $6,000 to help run Operation Success. Last year we had a girls' night, a boys' night, and we worked Monday through Thursday evenings from 7 to 8.30, providing a safe environment for all the young residents, middle school through high school, of, um, to come down and do their homework, and to receive tutoring, to receive um, just you know a helping hand from all the volunteers. We also this year um, we took them to a cultural event, which it was wonderful because they don't really experience that. We took 30 people into um, to see Elf, and it was amazing just to see their faces. Um, we provide backpacks for the students every year, summer reading books every summer, 
and um, just try to also have them give back to the community as well. Um, I'd like to also just introduce Peggy Regan, the heart and soul also of Operation Success, and so she can just give uh, another preview of what we're asking for. It's a lot of teamwork here with Janet and I, but first of all, I, I think she kind of covered everything. Um, we want to thank you for your continued support. I can't believe it's been 19 years. We've had a lot of kids coming through the door in and out, and it's um, really nice to see when they've <clears throat> achieved some success beyond um, middle school and high school, and we do see that, which is, which is great. Um, but I just want to thank you for your support and for the volunteers that come and help us, because we obviously couldn't run it four nights a week, uh, nine months a year without their help. So publicly thank all those people, and thank you. Um, we do have one request besides that um, with the CDBG, and maybe we can talk to um, both of you, but um, about six years ago, seven years ago, you helped us get computers, and they're running fine. Um, we have some support of people that know how to take care of them, but the CDBG does not cover um, printers, mm -hmm. like a laser mm -hmm. printer that um, the kids have projects to do, we really could use that help with that. And I don't know how, we don't know how to do that um, to get that down at Operation Success. Um, we have all these little printers that are breaking down um, all the time. And I wish I was, um, I hit the power ball or Peggy hit the power ball, but we don't have that. Um, so if you could ever give us some input on how we could do that um, to acquire a laser printer down there, that would be a big help to us down there. Um, and we'd really, truly appreciate that. And again, thank you so much for always um, keeping us going um, with the CDBG grant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Next. We, uh, those of you who are reporting on last year and also uh, making a request for this year, Lisa, you're last all the time. What are you doing? No, no, I'm kidding you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you. Welcome. Maybe I still am last. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I just wanted to, once again, thank you. This is obviously a program that we cannot do without your support. And um, just want to remind everyone kind of what it is. It's a three-part program. Um, we offer scholarships to our day camp. We actually go down... Um, with our buses and pick them up and bring them to Fidelity House and then they have summer day camp Minimum two weeks a day camp. Usually we try to at least get three weeks um, Scholarship for them so that they get swimming lessons in the morning free swim in the afternoon And it really is a day camp experience and then we also Pick them up during the school year bring them to Fidelity House They get free memberships scholarships to do any of the programs that really are geared towards them um, we actually pick them up twice a week. Uh, Saturday mornings also, I'm down there bright and early trying to get them to come and play basketball, which is a little tougher at 8.30, but they do it. Um, and then we also do an on-site program. So we try to meet as many kids' needs as we can and try to get them to come in the Fidelity House and being part of the community and seeing the world from a different perspective and meeting new kids and you know, it's a great program, but obviously we need your help with it. Um, I did ask for 2,000 more than in the past. Whatever you guys can do helps us out, but if it works out, that would be great too. So uh, what is the, the overall request, Lisa, is for? Uh, 16,000. 16, okay. Okay, questions? No? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Next. Mr. Flood. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I'd just like to acknowledge, you know, the great work that Lisa does at Fidelity House, as well as uh, Peggy and Janet for what they do at, uh, for Operation Success. Uh, pretty fortunate in this town to have many great uh, groups of people that help a lot of kids throughout the community and even, uh, even outside the community, which I think helps bring us all, all together, so. Just wanted to say that before I begin. Um, the, you know, I'm here to advocate for our Jobs, Jobs, Jobs program and our scholarship program. 
Our Jobs Hub Jobs program is uh, a jobs program for teens. It's, uh, it's been a great program uh, for a number of years, and uh, it, it allows some teens that may, you know, may not get that work experience outside of the club, may have a tough time getting a job, uh, to provide them an opportunity to, to work, uh, help build their resume, uh, experience what it's like to work with children, uh, to give back to their community. And, you know, I think a big part of, of this jobs program is that it affords, you know, it affords quite a few families the opportunity to um, not worry so much about their, their child, uh, knowing that they're working, they're earning a paycheck, and that helps. I mean, I can give you a number of stories of children that have helped pay their bills at home through this program, and uh, many of which, you know, low-income housing, and, uh, and I'll tell you, a couple of which have become, you know, gone on to become uh, Youth of the Year, which is the highest honor we have at our club. So, you know, I'm asking again if we could, uh, you know, if you could please consider the amount that we're requesting. It's $5,000, which would help a number of teenagers uh, help support themselves and also their families and hopefully, you know, provide them with a, uh, you know, with, uh, with the tools necessary to, you know, to prosper in the future, you know, beyond high school and into their, uh, into their college and adult, adult years. So. That's the jobs program. Any questions or? No. All right, I'm new to this process. <laughs> uh, and next, I'll say count your blessings. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's you know it's it's an honor to be here with the community and all of you. So, uh, next, our scholarships program. Um, we, you know, have thousands of members at the club, and every year with your you know. Uh, generous um, generosity, we're able to provide, um, you know, close to 70 families with scholarships that, um, you know, that provide kids with opportunities that they may not get anywhere else. It could be a swim lesson. It could be taking part in a basketball camp. It could be uh, taking part in uh, one of our three to five-year-old programs, uh, you know, where we're trying to help our membership. We're trying to help the kids. Uh, give them a great experience, and again, make it easier on the parents. I mean, we all know that there's, you know, single single family households in the town. We all know that there's uh, parents, you know, both parents working, and you know, and you know, we're just trying to help do our part, as I know you are for for the community. So, um, you know, we, we again last year. For a number of years, you've you've given us great support, and we appreciate that. And this year, um, I know you may see before you uh, uh, requesting twenty thousand dollars to continue all the great work that our great staff at the club is doing with the kids, and uh, obviously to you know to help the families, which is that's why we do what we do. So, thank you for your time and your consideration. Have a great evening, Kev. I, I actually do have a question. Are there any questions from the rest of the board? I just want to be clear. You said for job, job, jobs, you're requesting five? Correct. Okay, fine. Correct. It says in our, in our notes 10, but just wanted to be clear on that. For the job, oh, you know, that may be, um, I know we've done it with the Arlington Recreation Fidelity House in the past, that's the Boys and Girls Club, that's, 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 that's what we're requesting. That's, sorry, Correct. okay, Correct. okay, so. all right, thanks, Ted. Is that me, is that? Yeah. Okay, thanks, terrific, yeah. thank you very much. All set, thank you. Next. I'm Julie Kremer, co-founder of Foodlink. And Deanne DuPont, uh, also co-founder. And what we'll do is we'll give you a little bit of information about this year's grant. Uh, well, first we'll tell you about what, what we do, and then we'll tell you about this year's grant, and then a little bit about what we do for Arlington, and then what the grant is about. So Foodlink, what we do is we collect food from places like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, and we re redistributed that food to our organizations serving people in need. So we work with about 12 grocers and uh, retailers of, of uh, processed food. 
And then what we do is we, we want high quality food. So most of the food that we collect is produce, dairy, meats, and bread, and uh, high quality prepared foods. And we distribute that to organizations such as low income housing, food pantries, um, senior center, shelters, and places uh, serving people in need. This year, uh, with with over 80 volunteers now. And when, when we were here last year, we were at 60 volunteers. So with 80 volunteers, we distribute 360,000 pounds of food in a year. And this is highly nutritious food. Over 50% of what we collect is in the uh, fresh uh, produce and dense protein arena. Approximately, or over 70% of this food is provided to Arlington residents or programs that reside here in Arlington. Not only is our mission about food, but it's also an environmental program as well. So what we do is by connecting this food that would otherwise be going to waste, and this is good nutritious food, it goes to people in need rather than be thrown away. And when you throw away food, you're throwing away water, energy, people's time, and all of this just gets tossed into the you know, uh, waste. And, um, and so many resources are used to grow and transport this food. So our impact for this year, we had stated that we would um, at least touch at least 1,000 people. So it, we believe we're touching, at least we're making this food available to the facilities that we had put in our grant. Uh, in excess of 1,100, and we're meeting the quantity at that point. We were counting boxes rather than pounds, and we are meeting the goals, even though uh, one of the uh, low-income housing facilities dropped out of our program. So Julie's going to tell a little bit about what we do for Arlington. So our impact in Arlington, um, our two largest Arlington beneficiaries are the Arlington Food Pantry, both locations and the residents of the Arlington Housing Authority facilities. In addition to those places, uh, we provide healthy food year-round to eight other Arlington organizations, the Arlington Boys and Girls Club, which are snacks throughout the year, and it's generally fresh fruit um, all the time and bagels, and then there's often yogurt and other things. Um, Arlington Eats, which we help with the um, holiday weeks, um, the school breaks, February, April, and then the seven weeks over the course of the summer. Um, where they provide food in school and then the backpack program for food to go home with the kids. Mm -hmm. Arlington Senior Center where anybody can come into the building and at the very front table there's always bread and fresh produce. Um, other places in the building as well but anybody can go in there and take fresh produce or bread home with them. And that's five days a week Monday through Friday. And often like today we went there four times and each time that we delivered, and it's because we had different um, schedules of what we received, every time we delivered, it was empty from the time before. And that was 40 to 80 pounds each delivery. So there are days that it goes very quickly. Um, Arlington, I'm sorry, Elliott Community Services with the Young Adult Vocational Program, we provide food to them as well as uh, jobs for some of the youth there who bag the bread for us on Thursdays that goes to a pantry. Jermaine Lawrence. Thompson School gets year-round for their snack program, and Wayside Youth and Family Steps. Um, providing healthy food to our target population is a priority for us. We also help other local nonprofits by providing desserts and pastries to them for celebrations, meetings, and events, um, such as the Arlington Public Library, Arlington Council on Aging, Arlington Center for the Arts, Schwab Mill, Housing Corporation of Arlington, and many others. So this grant request is to, to help support our efforts of distrib distributing nutritious food directly to senior citizens, the disabled, and uh, families in the low to moderate income range that or residents of, of the um, facilities provided by the Arlington Housing Authority. So this group of individuals often have a hard time accessing healthy and nutritious food, uh, either due to uh, transportation, lack of funds, or the, the ability to just carry food, particularly the disabled and the seniors. And we, it's particularly difficult in the winter months or in extreme heat. So what we do is we actually deliver the food directly to 
where they live, meaning the community room or the office at Monotomy Manor. And we'll deliver at least once a week, and in fact, with Drake Village and Monotomy Manor, we deliver three times a week directly to these citizens. We don't deliver meat, but we do deliver you know, fresh produce, dairy, milk, and, uh, and bread. Um, our request is for $10,000, which um, we will deliver a minimum of 60,000 pounds of food during the year, during this upcoming fiscal year. And this is to individuals or at the Arlington Housing Facilities. And what this does is this works out to 17 cents a pound. And I would not want to be in your shoes because there's so many wonderful organizations here tonight. So, yep. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Kevin. Thank you. Yes, sorry, sorry, Dan. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, could you tell me a little bit more uh, about the ten thousand dollars and what it actually goes for, and how that, what fraction that is of the total budget? Because I know you're mostly volunteer run. So, uh, it, I mean, our volunteer run. So. Tell yep, me. it's about 22% of the budget. Okay. Most of it we did uh, hire an operations director because we have over 30 collections of food in, in, every week and uh, about that many deliveries as well. And trying to manage 80 volunteers with, with just the two of us got to be, and, and uh, apply for grants and things like that, got to, we, we, we couldn't do it anymore. So, we, so most of it's for um, the operations director, then um, some of it's for van expenses. Um, and then a little bit for supplies, okay. and I think technology. one, and, and yeah, technology. So uh, that would be what the costs are for. You answered my question. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So um, they do excellent work. My mother is a resident at, at uh, Cusick, and one day while I'm in there, after they had just delivered some food, uh, a lady left a shopping list for them. Uh, my son is coming to visit, would you please deliver? And had listed like five or six items. And I knew it didn't work that way. <laughs> so I went out and I bought this, these, these items and I, I brought them back. I go, in, I go in a week later, there's another list there. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna have to change. <laughs> I finally had to tell her who did it and stuff like that. But uh, anyhow, next up. If Next, I could just please. ask um, uh, uh, the testimony to be brief. The board does have a long agenda tonight, so thank you. Sure. Good evening. My name is Susan Stewart. I'm here on behalf of Arlington Eats. We are the organization that's just um, almost two years old, operating to uh, provide food to students who usually get free and reduced price lunches during the school year. We provide um, lunches for them when school is out and over the weekends, school vacations. We just came off a wonderful week of February vacation lunches down at Thompson where we served 230 lunches during the week and then also sent home food um, with the students and families every day. We are incredibly grateful for our community partners, Foodlink, Food for Free, um, the Arlington Food Pantry, we partner with the Boys and Girls Club, all sorts of organizations working really well together. Um, I brought you some snacks because I know <laughs> how hard it is to make important decisions and focus on the work when you're hungry. Um, and we provide snacks to the students in Arlington schools as well, all the elementary schools, and we are on track this year to distribute over 11,000 snacks during the school year. Anytime a student needs a snack, there's always one available for them. Um, the grant that we received from you last year helped um, to fund a portion of our summer lunch program last year. Um, out of the Thompson School Cafeteria, we provided about 20, uh, almost 2,500 lunches and meals that went home from our pop-up pantry, food that came from our community partners. Um, that was a wonderful success. We um, served meals four days a week over seven weeks. This summer, we're going to be doing the same thing. We hope that the numbers will be even greater. We're um, working on our outreach in the community. We have great social media presence and now lots of great contacts in all of the schools to help get the word out about the summer lunches. Our request this year is for $6,000, which funds a portion of it. The costs in our summer lunch program is in order to use the Thompson School Cafeteria, we pay a um, food service worker um, who's there three hours a day. Amazing, fantastic meals, flexible based on what comes in from deliveries or what's at hand, just um, awesome meals. That's our major expense and some groceries that we buy to go along with it. So that will help pay for, um, any funding that we get will help pay for our summer lunch program this summer. Thank Any you. questions? Any questions? No. 
Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your support. For 27 years, I've been asking people any samples, and finally, <laughs> <laughs> finally, so double what she needs, please. Uh -huh. Next, please. Next. Yep. Yeah. Next. Okay, that's it. Ted, okay, anything, yeah, final? Okay. Uh, I don't have any final remarks. Do you have any final remarks? Uh, well, just to state that there were a number of other requests um, that you have before you tonight, including ones from the Planning and Community Development Department, mm -hmm. and we'll look forward to talking with you in more greater detail about those in the future soon. We did learn today that we're going to receive $1,033,000 uh, $1, roughly, which is about $50,000 less than last year, unfortunately. Um, most of you in the room know that community development block grant funds have declined over the years, and I think we're back to FY12 funding levels, so unfortunately. But thank God we got them. The total requests are 1495000 so uh, right as of right now, right, right Ted? Yeah. yeah. And obviously we will be unable to fulfill all of those, but we'll do our best. What happens from here is we have a selectman subcommittee Mr. Dun Mr. Dunn and Mr. And Byrne. Mr. Byrne. And uh, so they will, they will uh, work with uh, both uh, Jennifer and with Ted, and they will come back to this board with a recommendation, and then the five members of this board, along with our town manager, actually will vote the final budget. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you both for your excellent work. Thank Take you. Take care. And thank thanks you. to all of you for being here. Okay, thanks. So uh, now we have new appointments, and we do request, if possible, that the person be here. But speaking of people being here, I was remiss that I didn't mention up front. Mrs. Mahan uh, cannot be with us tonight. She has a uh, family engagement that's been planned for a while, and she sends her regrets. She rarely uh, misses a meeting, but she's not able to be here with us tonight. Uh, new appointments, the Board of Library uh, Trustees. We have Amy Hampy. Amy, welcome. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Why do you want to do this, Amy? <laughs> well, I was so excited when I read about the board opening. Um, I love the library. I've always been a huge fan of libraries my entire life. And uh, since the six years that I lived in Arlington, I think the first thing I did was go sign up for my library card. Nice. Um, so go with my son to a lot of the programming and just felt like it would be a great way to get involved in the community. Thank you so much for your willingness to serve. Any questions, Can comments? Approval? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you, Amy, so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You. Uh, uh, next is an appointment to the uh, Commission on Disabilities, uh, Li Li Liza Molina, who is unable to be with us here tonight. But what we do in that case is, if, if I may please have a motion for approval, and Liza will visit with us another evening. So move. So move second. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. And finally, appointments to the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum Board of Trustees. We have Anne Marie Delaney Danizio, if I'm even close, and Megan McDavid. Yes. Anne Marie? Yes. Was I in the ballpark yes. at all? Was, was <laughs> yes, yes, oh, pretty thank close. You. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for your interest in serving. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest. Uh, well, I have been a volunteer at the Dallin Museum uh, since March of 2015. Uh, I am working on uh, the Education Committee. Mm -hmm. And um, so I am an associate trustee, and um, I guess they like me here. <laughs> <laughs> I, gradu I recently, uh, I am a graduate in uh, museum studies from Harvard Extension School. So I graduated in 2015, and I found um, with the Dallin Museum a good opportunity to um, be of use in a museum seating. And I have strong ties with Arlington as well. I've been, Thank you very much for the service you've provided and now the service you're willing to give. Appreciate that very much. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Discussion, questions? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you very much, Thank Anne Marie. You. And Megan. Hi. Uh, I've been volunteering at the Cyrus Dallin Art Museum for a little over a year now, um, docenting, giving tours, also involved with our art venture uh, family programs, uh, the summer soiree fundraiser. 
um, and most recently our sculpture workshop program for kids. Um, so I've been very involved and take an active part in um, discussions with the with the board. So. Thank you also, Megan, for your service so far and your willingness to continue to serve. Move approval. Second. Move approval. Second. Second. Discussion? No. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, oh. thanks Jerry. So uh, licenses and permits. We have a request for a sidewalk uh, fixture uh, permit. Beer buyer development, is it? Good yes, evening, sir. Tom. Uh, thank you, Tom Godfrey with Bear Briar Development. I'm here this evening to request a sidewalk permit license for the placement of three landscape planters in front of 1398 Mass Ave. We've got a situation there where we've got a sidewalk that ranges from nine to 15 feet in width, and we've hired an engineering firm to design the placement of the three planters to make sure we maintain the ADA sidewalk width behind it and proper distance behind the curb so that if cars park along the street and open doors, there's no conflicts. Um, we think it's a, a reasonable request to tie in with the planters that we have in front of 1398 that the town placed as well as some landscaping in front of 1410. Um, we've provided a picture of a sample of what the planter would look like as well as an engineered plan showing exactly where we'd like to place the planters. Okay. Yes, Mr. Dunn. So I was just, uh, I read the material and I just wasn't totally sure. Is it, is the intent uh, purely aesthetic or is there a functional? No, it's a, I guess a beautification plan. Mm -hmm. we've, um, we've got that wide swath of sidewalk in front of Massage Envy yep. and it's right at the front entrance. We feel it's a highly visible spot for cars coming into both buildings so we could um, catch their eyes when they come into the project there. Okay. Will I have to climb over to get into the meat house? Uh, no, you will not. No. <laughs> Move approval. Move approval. Second. Second. Uh, subject to all conditions. Yeah, the subject to all conditions is set forth, but there are no objections that we have in front of us at this point. Further discussion? No. Uh, anybody else here wishing to speak on this matter? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Uh, thank you, and uh, very well put together presentation and documentation here. Thank you. Hmm. Um, okay, uh, our, our favorite members of TAC are with us tonight. Discussion and approval, the Lake Street recommendations. Uh, Jeff or Howard, I'm not sure who's, who's handling it. Jeff? TAC House. Jeff is looking at Howard as in, aren't you doing this? <laughs> 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 Thank you, members of the board. Thank yes, you. Um, about a year ago, we came before you with a report on Lake Street, the request of the Board of Selectmen to look at um, improvements to improving traffic flow and safety along the Lake Street corridor. Um, we presented a recommendation, um, most notably for a signal at the bikeway crossing at Lake Street. And uh, while you were supportive of the signal, um, um, agreed that uh, further analysis should be done. So we collected uh, new data um, at the at, at the quarter um, in June uh, for two weeks, approximately uh, 16 days. Um, two weeks um, before or at as existing conditions, we collected traffic counts, uh, turning movement counts at intersections, travel times, um, uh, looked at accidents, um, t delay of crossings, and then two weeks with police officer control that simulated a uh, signal at the crossing coordinated with the Brooks, uh, the Brooks signal. And we did that during, during peak hours. So we measured both the baseline and then with police officer control. Um, I just wanna say um, it was the largest data collection effort that we've ever done in town at ATTAC. Uh, we had excellent support uh, from Adam, uh, town manager, board of selectmen, Arlington Police Department, um, EELS, ABAC, um, current TAC members, former TAC members, and a lot of residents. We probably had uh, a few dozen people um, that came out. So it was a, uh, it was a great collaborative, uh, comprehensive effort. So uh, that went very, very well. Um, with me tonight, Howard Muse, several of the working group members. Uh, Scott Smith is here. Um, 
Seth uh, Fetter-Spiels here, and also uh, resident Alan, Alan Linoff, who's been here and part of the working group for the year and a half we've been working on this, so I just want to recognize them on this, um, this project. So um, just a summary of what we found. Uh, Lake Street uh, experiences about 1,200 vehicles during the, the afternoon peak hour, approximately 4.30 to 4.45 to 5.45, about 400 uh, bikeway users in a, in a peak hour. Uh, with police officer control, we found that the traffic volume throughput uh, was increased between 10 and 15% during the peak hour. There were some higher increases uh, for short periods of time uh, when police officers were, were managing the signal. We'd expect that. I'm sorry, help me understand that again. A 15% increase in throughput, meaning? Right, so the trip. 15% more cars. More, ve more vehicles, right, th uh, northbound on Lake Street uh, during the peak hour. So okay. it's, about, uh, it's about in the 660 60 vehicle range. So. Um, we experienced higher percentages for shorter periods uh, with a coordinated, you know, computerized signal. We think we'd get to higher, you know, higher type throughputs at that intersection. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. Um, the bikeway crossings itself, so it was anywhere between when the bike, uh, bikes or pedestrians arrived, uh, between zero delay if they came when the police officers were waving folks across or up to 40 seconds delay if they came right at, at the point where they were stopped. And the average was about 20 seconds delay um, per user, kind of, kind of right, right in the middle there. Um, vehicle travel times. So without police officer control, um, the times basically from Route 2 to Mass Ave, about 1.2 miles, were anywhere from 10 to 24 minutes was the longest without control. Then with control, it was from eight to 20 minutes. So on average, about four minutes uh, faster with police officer control than without. Um, there's some variation there between uh, days and weather conditions, and, and, but about, about four minutes um, faster. The vehicle queue lengths um, were actually about the same. We had thought they might get shorter with police officer control, although the behavior of the queues was different. Um, as it is today, you kind of just go along at you know, snail's pace. Um, with police officer control, it behaved like a signal where you get progression of vehicles. You, you move in platoons uh, throughout the corridor. Um, so there's a little difference in how, how the traffic moved in that progression. Um, we do have some updated um, crash information. So in the last two years, in 2014 and 2015, there were 14 crashes um, at the bikeway. Two of those were pedestrians, uh, pedestrian crashes. The, the, the other 12 were vehicle crashes, most of those being rear-end collisions in that, you know, that stop-and-go condition uh, where vehicles are trying. So four, 14 additional crashes in the last two years. Um, the prior accidents crash records were about one injury collision. Uh, we average about one a year at the bikeway crossing with a pedestrian or bicycle. So we have two in the, in the last two years. So that's, that's about the same average, about one injury with a pedestrian or bicycle a year at that crossing. So our analysis supports our original recommendation of a signal, although because of the complexities of um, implementing a signal, we're, we're still recommending that a, a design review committee be formed um, to evaluate the design details, operations, um, planning, uh, design development, and also, also costs. Uh, because there's a lot of details and decisions to be made on how the signal would actually operate at this location. It may not have to operate, you know, 24-7 as a signal. It could operate as flash and the coordination with Brooks and so forth. Um, so we're, we're still recommending our, uh, our rec you know, a s the board to consider a signal at this location, but would like to suggest that a design review committee be formed um, with members of TAC, um, Board of Selectmen, a representative, um, DPW, uh, Police Department, ABAC, EELS, uh, Walk Arlington, and a traffic, uh, professional traffic consultant as part of that design review committee. Okay. Questions, comments? Yes, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of this. I mean, I think this is just what we were looking for um, with this uh, simulation. I did have one question on some of the findings. Um, I, I see that you saw the increase in throughput northbound, but as I'm looking at the table, I also see a slight decrease in throughput going southbound, and I was wondering right. if, if you could, if 
you have any theories or explanations. Yeah, well, I think northbound, northbound is queued up, and when, when you're providing that uh, simulation, you're unleashing some of that, uh, that capacity and get, getting more, more throughput. Yeah. Southbound, we, you know, we don't generally have that type of queuing, that late, late in demand in the southbound direction. So southbound, we're pro whatever it is southbound, we're processing it yeah. on, on that day. But nor northbound, you know, we have a queue, and if we can manage that better through um, simulation of a traffic signal, we can actually push more through. So there's nothing more to push through on the southbound side. The northbound, we can we can get more vehicles through because of that that long delay in queue. Yeah, um, I, I realize that we probably have other people to to speak on this, but I want to say that at first blush, looking at at this, I mean, I see a trade-off of you know, saving a four minute daily delay during rush hour for, for motorists versus a 20 second delay for bicyclists there. If, if they're commuting every single day, I mean, you basically, you, you're looking at uh, in the course of a week, 20 minutes versus, you know, a minute and 40 second inconvenience. Um, I, I, on the face of it, it looks like you've, you've, you know, made a persuasive case here, presented a persuasive case for the signalization. Yeah. Uh, uh, Howard Muse, I'm chair of the TAC. I um, also participated in the study uh, with Jeff. And uh, one of the things that we found interesting when we were doing the counts of people crossing the bike path is a lot of people stopped and asked us what we were doing. Hmm. And when we told them we were looking at the idea of putting a signal, I was surprised at how many people indicated that they thought that that was a good idea, even as they were being stopped by the police officers to cross the street. Now, that's totally anecdotal. We don't have survey data or anything like that. But um, I did think it was interesting that a lot of people, especially walkers, seem to um, appreciate the idea of having a signal there. Hmm. Are you asking, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Dan. Uh, so on the injury information, so you talk about pedestrian, you talk about vehicle. What's the, how does a bike count, in the, is a bike rider count in that? Or were there no... There were there were no uh, crashes over the last two years with with uh, bicyclists at at the path itself, the okay. path crossing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, actually, I should say, um, I uh, I've only become more convinced by the data and my personal experience and my observations that we should be going forward on this. So, I'm uh, looking forward to having the conversation, but it'll it'll take something new and big for me to change my mind. I think at this point. And am I right? You pretty much every day are on this route. Not this time of year. Uh, I, I'm uh, a. I have become a fair weather bicyclist <laughs> as <laughs> as I become wimpier in my old age. <laughs> yeah, I'm a dream bicyclist. I dream yeah. that I'm doing it. But yeah. I don't know yet. And, and so my experience. I, I've relayed this before um, at this meeting, but I'll do it again. Which is that my experience is that even when I'm trying to. Um, not interrupt the traffic flow. You know, there's a stop sign there, and I come up and I come to the stop sign, and I am waiting for that light to change. The cars will stop and they will wave at me to go. And I'm like, no, you've got a green light, go. And they'll just sit there and they'll wave at me to go. And I know just by being there, I have stopped the traffic from flowing. And if we put a light there, that's going to change that behavior. And I, I'm, um, I, I think it, it, because of all the indications are that it will be such an improvement for the, the uh, travelers there that I, I think it's a good move. The, the only negative that I have heard uh, that, I mean, this excellent work is always by TAC, is that if we speed it up, more people are going to now use Lake Street than used to. But I can't see saving four minutes is going to really get people to, that there will be that much increase of traffic. And, uh, and did, you, did you find that in it when the police officer was there? Was there a higher car count? I wouldn't think it's, people would have known about it yet, right? So, well, we we, we did it um, over the period of a week in hopes of getting some indication of that. But uh, I I think you're right that it wasn't long enough that it was going to attract people from other other bottlenecks in the area. One thing I would add is that um, there's recently been an improvement of the Route 2, Route 16 interchange. I don't know how many of you use that on a regular basis. This time of year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, although it's not complete because they're in the process of putting up the new signal heads and signal, um, they added a third departure lane on Route 2. And from what I've been able to see of it, it's made a difference at that location. 
and I suspect with the signal changes, there might be some further improvement. So potentially that would offset the fact that there's been an improvement on Lake Street. Um, I, I don't know what the magnitude of the improvement is at that location, but it, at least when I've been through there at, in the evening peak hour, I don't know about the after, uh, morning, uh, it does seem to make things run better than they had been. Was that? Um, yeah, you know, just, uh, I, I will point out, I, I was, I think, the sole vote to support this um, last time it was in front of us. and. I am also inclined to do it again, but I look forward to the conversation. I do just want to point out um, the work that was done on this. I, uh, I know we ask a lot of TAC, um, you know, on basically every meeting. And uh, once again, they've gone, you know, over and above. So thank you both very much. Thanks, appreciate it. And all the neighbors and others who participated. Mm -hmm. Would anybody else like to speak on this matter? Yes. Phil Goff. <clears throat> <laughs> Would you like to say my address, Kevin? Where is? <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Phil Goff, uh, 94 Grafton Street is the address in East Arlington. I am the co-chair of East Arlington Livable Streets Coalition, Eels Coalition, has, as Howard or Jeff had mentioned, for those that aren't familiar with the acronym. Um, we are a group, ostensibly a very informal group. We don't have 501c3 status. Um, we don't have paid membership, but we have about 300 people or so on our email list and 450, 500 um, Facebook friends as well. We have heard um, here and there, uh, definitely there is a bit of a diversity of opinion about the Lake Street signal from the various people who are connected to the EOS Coalition by email. Um, we also have an informal board of about 10 or 12 people and we meet monthly and occasionally we get uh, new people in, but of the 10 or 12 people um, who regularly come, who we consider our advisory board, um, there is a lot of concern and skepticism about this light. And actually before, before I get into that, um, I do wanna applaud the board selectmen and the, the town in general, DPW town manager for pursuing this. I and mean, this is clearly a big issue, uh, the backups on Lake Street. I've been caught in them a few times uh, as well in a car, and um, my wife has on a number of occasions. It's clearly a big issue, and um, uh, certainly the cut through traffic that's created through Kelwood Manor is a problem uh, as well. TAC, of course, has done a great job. EELS Coalition, as Jeff had mentioned, did sort of help with some of the counts, and we are happy to do that because we think it, this is an important um, issue to, to study. I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the concerns that we have about what we think could be unintended consequences. Certainly there are great intentions behind the signal and it's very understandable at first blush that a lot of people perhaps that they were running into on the bike path would say, yeah, this is, this is a great idea. Um, I think the, the delays caused um, for bike commuters or, or walk commuters is, is pretty trivial, uh, trivial, I agree with, I guess what, Selectman so Kiro said to wait 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it may be, versus the cars is, is sort of a secondary issue. Um, again, some of those un unintended consequences. I think, first of all, currently, uh, the four things I wanted to kind of point out. Um, currently, as someone mentioned, Dan, maybe? <laughs> uh, oh, yes, it was you that talked about, you know, cars are very accustomed, drivers are very accustomed to slowing down and stopping. I agree, they stop a little too quickly. Uh, but it's very rare that you see your car pass through the Brooks intersection when they have a green and then the Minuteman path at more than maybe 10 or 15 miles an hour. There's sight line issues, there's the curve, there's a number of reasons, but mostly it's because motorists, they don't want to hit someone on foot and they don't want to hit certainly a child, um, a cyclist, et cetera. So people are going slowly. So that's kind of the current. There have been very few crashes. It sounds like there's been a couple for sure and there are lots of near misses. That's currently, in the future, the concern we have is with the signal, um, you know, motorists will see that double green and they will simply drive through at speed, uh, which you know, generally will be probably about 30 miles an hour. So that, that's one issue. So there's a speed issue uh, for cars. There's also a speed issue for bicycles. Right now, uh, heaven forbid, we know that most bikes probably do not actually come to a full stop and put their foot down. It sounds like Dan does on a regular basis. Some days. Uh, 
Many probably roll through that stop sign and some go even a little bit faster. But generally, the uh, bicyclists, whether commuters or weekend people, generally they're slowing down because they know to bomb through, there's a high likelihood they're going to get hit by a car. What will change with the signal is bikes will either come and slow to a stop if they have the red, but the bigger concern is when there's a green light, bicyclists basically are remaining at speed in either direction, coming through on a green light at you know 15 plus mile an hour clip, um, especially with uh, on the AM commute to Alewife, we know there's hundreds of people on foot and, and on bike who do that. There's also hardy children and parents crossing. Um, we think that to some degree the design review committee of which um, EELS Coalition uh, is very happy to be part of that. We think some of that could be mitigated, but that's sort of another unintended consequence that we have some concerns about. Um, third one is the, the bottleneck that currently that path is obviously creating, especially coupled with the, um, with the signal at Brooks. That bottleneck acts as a regulator um, and allows a certain amount of volume of cars to pass on their way to Mass Ave. Without that bottleneck, the regulator then becomes the Mass Ave signal and a concern that a number of people, especially who live around the Hardy School and such, have is that as that queue, instead of getting bottleneck at the path and Brooks, moves up to the Mass Ave signal as a bottleneck, that many more people um, will actually come through the Brooks signal and take a right on Brooks and then cut through the neighborhood if they're heading uh, inbound to Cambridge or to, to Medford, other, other points such as that. Um, and then the other that has come up before and we don't quite have all the data and that is just the potential induced traffic that uh, may be created by a much shorter queue of cars um, on Lake Street that sometimes winds up, we know the off ramp, um, that many motorists who are now um, staying on Route 2 to Route 16, which in theory what many should be doing, because we know certainly a lot of these people coming through on Lake Street are not necessarily Arlington residents. Um, if they see all of a sudden that, and they hear from their friends and others, Lake Street all of a sudden flows pretty well, we have that concern that there will actually be more traffic coming through on Lake Street. It may actually move quicker, for sure, but it actually, from a volume point of view, might be quicker, I mean, it might be heavier, and more of those people cutting through the neighborhood around the uh, Hardy School off of Brooks. So those, those are the four unintended consequences that we're concerned about. Uh, we're happy to talk more about those um, I with our representative, maybe it's me, perhaps someone else on the design review committee. Um, we do think that that committee needs to take some of these concerns into account uh, and use many of them to create evaluation criteria to kind of look at how this signal gets designed. Um, public safety really should be the number one criterion. I think, I suspect we would all agree with that, not so much you know, what is the maximum throughput, what is the maximum saving of um, time uh, for motorists coming through. And I think that based on that, a no-build option should potentially be considered by the review committee. I know it's not your purview to sort of make those demands on the review committee now, but just throwing it out there, a no-build meaning tweaks perhaps to the brook signal combined with some new signage or perhaps traffic diversion, et cetera, in Kelwood Manor, and maybe some slight changes to the design of the Minuteman path where it crosses Lake Street to uh, create different deflections uh, of, of uh, bicyclists coming through uh, a as a potential. I think that, that needs to be looked at. I think with um, looking at that, in addition to, of course, looking at and evaluating some of the options of the signal, hopefully will be a win-win um, for the town and for the neighborhood. Thanks so much. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> Anybody else? Sir? I'm Alan Linov. I live on uh, Colonial Drive just off Lake Street. I just wanted to mention a couple things in relation to the concerns about unintended consequences, which certainly are uh, very valid. Uh, regarding the issue of uh, the speed along Lake Street as well as attracting additional traffic there. In a sense, we already have an experiment about that going on every winter when there's much less traffic on the, uh, on the bikeway. So certainly during the, the, the winter months, uh, the traffic goes much faster. If we are seeing more traffic attracted, 
it's clearly not having a big effect. And likewise, I don't think we're seeing uh, consistently big problems with speed. And of course, what we're really trying to regulate with a traffic signal is the, the rush hour flow, where we're really talking about taking it from extremely slow to slow, <laughs> not making it fast. Uh, I also, regarding the issue of cut through that was looked at in the study uh, and the, by counting the cars as they're coming down Lake Street, the ones going in each direction, you would expect if you're getting better flow down the main line there of Lake Street, you'd have similarly increased proportional flow in each of the directions out of there. Uh, the study showed that the, it was actually a slight decrease in the flow out along Brook Street. I don't know, I wouldn't expect that would be a consistent effect, but it certainly there wasn't any hint of increased uh, cut through uh, traffic. I, I got motivated to participate in this working group while sitting uh, for many, many minutes on many days waiting in traffic. It has been a quality of life issue for, for me, my members of my family, and I've heard a lot about it from my neighbors, so we have an existing problem now. And currently what we really have is a very inefficient, inefficient system where it's not just traffic going slowly through there. There's a lot of green light cycle on Brooks Ave that is getting missed by people waiting at the, uh, at the bikeway, either for traffic or for a concern that there may be traffic coming. So while there are uh, potentially some unintended co consequences that could come out of this, I think that the uh, design committee could address all of that. And uh, whatever the situation, having a very inefficient travel through that section, that's not the best answer for any of the potential concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yep, Scott. Scott Smith, on the review committee and on both TAC and ABAC, I'll just briefly say when this was first broached three years ago, I was extremely skeptical uh, for many of the reasons that Phil mentioned. I think I'm now in favor. I think what's persuaded me was the success of the experiment. I was part of that army of volunteers uh, and the uh, crash data that Jeff reported, And but I hope that the design committee uh, does look seriously at the concerns that Phil raised. Thank you. Okay, um, board members, anybody in motion? Mr. Byrne. Um, I will move approval on uh, tax recommendation to form a design review committee. And um, I, I do appreciate all, all the commentary today and I, and I do agree with you know several of the speakers that this committee will be a good venue to address some of the issues brought up by EALS, so thank you very much. Do you have a second? Second. Second. Mr. Dunn. Uh, oh, do sorry, you, uh, Mr. Dunn for a second. That's okay. I, I just, actually, I just want to clarify on the motion. Are we, um, I don't know that we have the, exactly the specificity we need yet, like based on the what's what they've for written for the here. recommendation. In yeah. The so, like, who would be the chair? When do we want them to return back? Like, do we want to talk about any of those details, or do we want to see perhaps if I don't, I don't know if it's appropriate, but perhaps the town manager would be the the right person to to run that project. I, um, so, I absolutely support what you're trying to do. So, I'm I just, I guess I will say my my gut tells me with the, with the timeline. And uh, when they report back, I, I would like them to meet prior to, and have them kind of work that out. Because okay. I, um, I don't want to put a firm deadline on a committee that we're forming. Um, I do agree that I don't want it to go on forever, but I think that um, you know they have. To, I think that the group will have to decide, you know, even w what issues are in front of them. I'm sure there are more, you know, unintended consequences that will come along other than the four that were brought up tonight. So I really don't want to kind of handcuff them off the bat. Um, in terms of a, um, a chairperson, I, I would think that it would, for at least, uh, I would probably see it being the chair of TAC or, or his designee. Um, I think that that is, um, would make sense to, and it would be aligned with a lot of the work that's been done before, but I'm happy to entertain other ideas. <clears throat> so I, I, I would suggest, um, if I may, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that if the board voted favorably on Mr. Burns uh, motion that I could work with TAC and the named groups to put a roster together 
bring it back to the board for ratification. Okay. And that, that will designate who the chairman is and how the structure will Perfect. work, and we can move from there. That works for me. Great. Yep. Okay. Are you all set, Dan? Yep. Thank Good you. Job. Thank you. I'm happy to support it. I, I will note, um, you know, thank you, Phil, for all of your, your remarks. I note that there actually is a difference, too, between uh, December no 2014 memo we received where EELS wasn't actually named mm -hmm. on the Design Review Committee and the current recommendation does does have you, and I think it's a recognition of all of the work, of course, that you did in helping with the data collection. Mm -hmm. And I'm cautiously optimistic that when a solution is found that we actually will cut down on some of the cut through traffic that uh, occurs right now. I just wanted to note, um, you know, add on to what Mr. Linoff uh, said. Currently, some of the um, the GPS programs that are sensitive to, to traffic delays will actually route people who are going northbound on Lake Street, have them take a left turn into Kelwin Manor, go around, come back southbound, and then cut into the neighborhood. So it's all legal. But the, the cut through traffic is happening now as a result of the delays, despite all of the signage that we've put up uh, around no right turns. So um, I'm very happy with the direction we're going. Okay, well said. Okay, all those in favor by the motion by Mr. Byrne and seconded by uh, Mr. Dunn, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay, thank you all for your great work on this. Now we have a, a request for a statement of non-opposition to medical marijuana dispensary from the Massachusetts Patients Foundation. Yes, yeah, we're gonna start with Mr. Chapter Lane, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just a brief introduction for the board. Uh, when the Massachusetts Patient Foundation was last before the board in uh, late 2015, uh, there was a presentation about their group's qualifications and their interest in locating a medical marijuana dispensary in Arlington. And at the end of that discussion, the board authorized myself and town council uh, to discuss uh, what could be included in a community benefit agreement that would satif uh, satisfy some of the concerns of the town, of the Department of Health and Human Services, of the police department, uh, and the, the board uh, voted for us to, to pursue that. Uh, town Council and I did that. Uh, we met with Attorney Romano, um, and I'm forgetting your first name. Joseph. Joseph. Uh, and we, we had a very good discussion and brought back a draft community benefit agreement that's uh, before the board tonight. Um, it uh, primarily includes uh, the town receiving 3% of their uh, revenue uh, as a mitigation to be able to provide um, offset to the costs we think we'll incur in terms of regulating and policing the location of a dispensary. Uh, so um, town council and I felt that that was satisfactory based on the guidance we were given by the board. Uh, so uh, I will not speak for them, but they are back here today asking for the board's either support or a statement of non-opposition. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. Thank you, members of the board, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're, we're happy to be back here in front of you. Uh, I, I know we had something of a, an extensive presentation a few months ago, and so I won't belabor and sort of start all that over again unless the board wishes uh, me to do so. Uh, we're, we're here with uh, members of the Massachusetts Patient Foundation. Uh, Joseph Lacache is here. Um, maybe just quickly can introduce other members of Valerio Romano, uh, Milk, um, State Street in Boston. Yeah, and a few people that we have is our COO, Daniel Cardin. Uh, who has a medical services background, Corey Cutler, who's our field ops uh, legal background. We have um, Moshe Bleich, who's a rabbi of the Wellesley West and Chabad Center. Uh, and we have Eric Johnson, who's part of the Land Telecommunications Security Team. Thank you. So, you know, I, I, however the board wishes us to proceed, if, if there's questions that I might be able to answer, uh, any, anyway, you know, we're at the board's. Well, I, I, if I may just start with, would you tell us what's changed since you were here last? So for example, I believe you didn't have a, a place to grow at that time, uh, your activity in other cities or towns, or so what's new since we saw you last? Absolutely, so we now have a purchase agreement on a 28 acre former Bayer facility in Fitchburg for cultivation, as well as an 18,000 square foot facility in Holyoke. Uh, today we met with the leadership of Fitchburg, and we're expecting a letter in the next week or so of non-opposition or support from them. In Holyoke, we've already received a letter of support for the cultivation there as well. Um, we've also submitted a draft siting profile to the town of Needham. Uh, at the end of 60 days from that date of, date of submission, the town of Needham will um, 
meet and the Board of Selectmen will interview all the different potential applicants in that town as well. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from the board? No? Yeah, yeah Joe. Uh, thank, thank you. No, I just, I do have a couple. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the, the work on this. Um, you know, I think you all know that I had some real grave concerns about this. I'm happy that the uh, town officials have, um, you know, worked with the foundation um, to, to try to address some of them. I did have a couple questions which might be addressed to the town manager um, on this. Um, in the draft um, uh, community uh, benefit agreement that, that's here, um, First of all, correct me if I'm wrong, we're not uh, accepting the, the host community agreement right now tonight with our vote if we go forward, are we? We are simply voting uh, non-opposition or, or approval, or is it contingent upon? The well, agreement? so m my understanding was that the, the board would like to see a satisfactory draft of a community benefit agreement okay. before contemplating voting non-opposition or support, but I also do not see the board's vote tonight as agreeing to the exact terms that are before you or, or, or language that's before you. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. I, I was just curious because I, I did notice there is, does seem to be um, kind of an, a, uh, a mismatch between what's in this agreement and what uh, the chief has represented to us. The, the impact would potentially be on, on uh, his department. And uh, I didn't know if you had some more context you could give us on that. There's a memo from the chief that was in our packets as well. Um, but, uh, a mismatch in terms of? Uh, the, the financial impact on the department that he foresees. So the um, p part of the, the challenge for town council and I, and I, I would imagine part of the challenge for the applicant is um, projecting exactly what their revenue will be. Mm -hmm. uh, so the community benefit agreement speaks to 3% of gross revenue. Mm -hmm. And the estimates that uh, the applicant has put forth is that could result in anywhere between $200,000 or $500,000 in uh, revenue for the town based okay. on what their sales actually are. So you're absolutely Annually. correct. Annually, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, so on the low end, you're right that that would not satisfy okay. uh, what the police chief is requesting. Can you speak louder, please, so we can hear you in the back? Can you turn that up? Are these yeah. amplifying? Just try and speak louder, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to take the seat right there in the front row? Yeah, might come be up here. Maybe Sorry. louder into, into this, closer? It's not ampli no, it's it amplifying. It's just closer. It's just for television. Uh, so, um, on the, yeah, again, on the low end, uh, it, it would not meet the chief's concerns. On the high end, it certainly would. Uh, so. Uh, I guess where, where, where we, uh, where Doug and I came down was we felt that this was financially an agreement that did better than a number of other communities that have executed mm -hmm. community benefit agreements. And, and based on that and based on what the projections could result in, felt like it was a fair agreement for the town. And, and what's the, uh, thank you, what's the mechanism for, um, for just verifying the revenues of the share? So, uh, you know, that, that's a... They did just turn on the <laughs> Oh, <laughs> they do. There you go. Can you hear us better now? Sorry about that. You know, I'm, I'm sorry I don't know that answer offhand. I'm, I'm assuming that we're going to work through the DPH for verification of how much product is actually moved through the store. Okay. Uh, but I, I should confirm that for you, Mr. Kiro. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, um, the, I, I think it was in our packet, or maybe it was in the memo that the uh, town council sent us, um, it was stated that... Um, the Board of Health also had looked at this um, and looked at regulations around this. And was there any report on available on on the Board of Health? So the Board of Health is represented here tonight. If you want to, oh, ask they are. Like, yes. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Um, and just the the last thing I just wanted to ask was um, I noticed there was an article just I think two days ago about Brookline's experience, and I did notice that as one of the conditions. Uh, in Brookline that the um, dispensary was open by appointment only. And I don't know if the mechanism for achieving a similar condition here, if we were to choose to do that, is through the agreement or if, or if there's another mechanism by which um, we are able to put that type of a condition on. And I recognize, I recognize town council is not available <laughs> to it, so I might be putting you at a disadvantage. But um, Yeah, so I, I, didn't, I didn't read that story. Um, <laughs> What's the benefit of appointment only? 
I, I think they were they were concerned that there would be a lot of um, traffic going in and out. It would be difficult to to control. Was my understanding was was one of the, the concerns that was raised in Brookline. Was there was there a notice period for making an appointment or? I don't. That's all I read. Yeah. 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 I just know it was in the paper, so I, I didn't research it further. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Dunn. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just first, before I just want to point out. Uh, so there's three empty seats up front. If you want to come in, and I noticed the, um, there's a woman who's stuck by this door. You can pull up right in front of the front row right here if it, that's more convenient to you. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, Adam, tell me how this would work if uh, we decided that we wanted to go forward. Is there uh, would is this a would we need to come to a final agreement and sign the agreement before the uh, 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 of taking our vote and uh, doing approval or non approval or is the, like how does this work so my my understanding is really what what the applicant needs is for this statement of non opposition or support to be able to get their dph permit not any permit from the town um, but my understanding and i let them speak for themselves it's their common understanding is that this board's vote for non-opposition or support is tied to us signing a successful community benefit agreement. So if we, I mean, I, my, my assumption is that they're not gonna walk away from signing something that we're happy with because they would risk this board removing its support. And certainly, so I, I definitely speak to that. And um, in Holliston, for instance, as an example, uh, the the uh, letter of support or non-opposition actually was amended to say this is contingent on successful, you know, uh, execution of uh, a community host or host community agreement. So you can certainly write that language in, and it should solve uh, the board's concern on that. Uh, I, I think okay. the the template letter provided by the department is sort of a base to give to help with their concerns, but there's no reason that a town shouldn't be able to make the amend make that type of amendment on it. So, Mr. Greeley, then um, my next question, I think, again, towards Adam. So, Adam, I, the earlier, a few minutes ago, I think you said that you didn't anticipate that we'd actually take a vote tonight. Um, did I misunderstand you? Or? No, I, I, I'm sorry. I meant to say I was not anticipating the board would be voting on the community benefit agreement, right. uh, simply just a statement of non-opposition or support. Okay. Um, Mr. Greeley, uh, no. I move that we sign the statement of non-opposition. With contingent upon approval, uh, with an, uh, um, the mechanism attached to that condition of non-approval that uh, we execute a future benefit agreement. And I make that motion because I'm uh, satisfied by the process and the procedure, and I'm satisfied by the benefits that we get that they account for what uh, we need out of this. I think that, and I, when we talked about this last time, I expressed um, why I thought that it was important that Arlington be open to all establishments, including a dispensary. And so uh, you got my motion. Okay. Should I second? Yeah, I, I will second that. And um, I, I think um, I agree with Dan's sentiments. And at the last meeting, I, I was also um, pretty adamant about supporting this for several reasons. Um, one was the vote that was taken to actually um, approve medical RON in Massachusetts. And uh, the town overwhelmingly voted to support it. And two, um, as I said, I think there is a space for medical marijuana in the pain management spectrum. When we look at opioids, I, um, I think that there is a place to um, kind of take away from prescribing opioids and in inserting medical marijuana. And um, that's something I, I certainly hope will happen moving forward. Um, actually, I saw, um, I think last week, Elizabeth Warren commissioned a, a study to actually look at that as well. Um, so I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support that uh, motion by Dan. Joe. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think you all know, again, I, I feel uncomfortable with this, um, but I do appreciate the due diligence that's been exercised. Um, you know, in light of, and I recognize the vote as well that the community took. Um, so at this point, I, I'm inclined to support signing a letter of non-opposition, although, Mr. Chair, I would, if, if we could hear from our Board of Health be, before we actually take the vote, I would um, like, like to just hear um, what their process was and 
and uh, where they came down on it, if it's possible. Of course. Who's here from the Board of Health, please? Christine and Jim. Hi, thank you. Christine Bongiorno, Director of Health and Human Services. I have here with me Inspector Feeney. Um, as you are aware, the Board of Health um, will be promulgating regulations. Pull, that, pull the mic. Thank you. I guess I'm a little shorter than the last speaker. Uh, as you're aware, the Board of Health will be promulgating regulations to address um, ma medical marijuana at the local level. It will allow us to um, inspect and follow up on any complaints that come in. Also work directly with the, um, the facility um, to ensure that the regulations from the state level are, are enforced. Um, I'm not sure if you have any questions about the specifics of the regulations that we're putting in place. I, I, was just, nope. I was just curious on the report no. and where, where the process stands. Yeah. The details of, I mean, do you want an overview of what will be put in place by the Board of Health? I think that'd be helpful. Yeah, yeah give please. The sure. So generally speaking, the regulations don't uh, really go beyond what the state is requiring. The state's regulations that are already in effect through the Department of Public Health are quite comprehensive and cover, you know, the, the full uh, spectrum of issues. Our regulations essentially adopt those to a certain extent and allow uh, a mechanism for local oversight and inspection such that we can respond to complaints and conduct inspections as necessary to ensure Arlington's public health and safety. Uh, there are a few uh, minor variations, a few things that uh, are covered in the Board of Health regulation that are specific to Arlington that would not be covered in the state's regulation which pertains directly to medical marijuana is ensuring that a medical marijuana facility in Arlington uh, is operating solely for that purpose. So it limits convenience co-buys, so you wouldn't be able to also sell alcohol, tobacco, e-cigarettes, lottery uh, places. Uh, it currently has a placeholder for placing restrictions on the hours of operation. Uh, and I think... Uh, it also has a requirement for the uh, dispensary to hold an annual community meeting with uh, the local abutters or stakeholders and other people who may have an interest uh, in that business to discuss any concerns and be able to provide feedback. And that is uh, something that would be done uh, annually by the RMD, the dispensary, excuse me. Uh, uh, and I think the other... You know, at the core of the regulation, uh, as is the case with most other Board of Health regulations, is just permitting and ensuring that uh, that the people, you know, appropriate, appropriately authorized people are engaged in the business that they're supposed to be engaged in. So that would be permitting both the dispensary uh, and the dispensary agents working within that dispensary. So making sure it's the, the right people doing the right things. Okay. Well said. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you both. Thank you. Is anybody else here wishing to speak on this matter? Um, okay. Um, then I, I am. I am going to support non-opposition, but I don't want that to imply. And I would like wording in there that that doesn't necessarily mean I would then support necessarily the host community agreement. This is all new to us. We don't know what's going to happen uh, once they go through the redevelopment board for the permitting and et cetera. And full disclosure, I have been uh, approached by another organization also interested in opening a medical marijuana dispensary in Arlington. Whether this board thinks we should have two or not, I don't know. I mean, we, uh, what we've done on liquor stores and other things. Uh, so anyhow, I support it. I do support this at uh, the uh, medical marijuana dispensaries, but I think a lot of information has yet to come out in terms of experience uh, uh, of those uh, and what this would look like for us. So anyhow, that's where I am at this point. Any, any other thoughts, comments? Okay. So on the motion by Mr. Dunn and seconded by Mr. Byrne, all those in favor of signing the letter of non-opposition, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay. Thank you, and thanks for choosing Arlington. Thank you, members of the board. Thank you. Thank you.
Was this a fun meeting for all of you? Did you, <laughs> do you want to come back? It's like almost every Monday night. No. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item, net metering letter to the legislature. Ryan Katofsky. You've earned your time. Yes. I, I guess I know how to clear a room. <laughs> So uh, good evening. Thanks for um, taking this up this evening. I think as, I as, I'm sorry. sorry. Yep. I think that she might have wanted to say something. Did you want to speak on this, ma'am? Oh, we approved you. God bless you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we were told you couldn't be here. I'm sorry. Moraine. Huh? Fran. Oh, Fran. Okay. Well, we approved you. Wanna, Brian, excuse me, do you want to yeah. give a speech? <laughs> you don't have to. We, but thank you for your willingness, right? It's on the uh, Commission on Disabilities you've been appointed to, correct? Yes. Mr. You know, let, let, I would, if perhaps, if we, I don't know if we want to do that metering and then hear from her, but I think we, we invite all appointees. And I'd yes, like to, okay. I'm, I'm Ryan, happy to let her go first. Do you mind yeah, not just at all. and help her? Come on forward. It's Lisa? Yes. yes, please come forward here to the mic. There's millions watching at home, but don't get nervous. <laughs> so, yeah, come right up to the microphone, if you would. So, Liza or? Lisa. Lisa, okay. Uh, Lisa Molina, and tonight we appointed you to the Commission on Disabilities, and normally we ask, why would you like to serve on the Commission on Disabilities, Lisa? Oh dear, um, <laughs> um, a million reasons, but uh, mostly to advocate for, um, hopefully, for advancement, for change. Um, Arlington has already made. Um, it's actually, if you get closer to the mic, it gets a little bit easier. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, Arlington has already made some very visible changes. Um, I've been living here. I'm moved from uh, Cambridge. Um, I've been here for nine years and I definitely have noticed the differences that have occurred and, and I would just like to be able to contribute to the next... Um, next group of changes. Yes, 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 absolutely. Well, thank you for coming to Arlington from Cambridge. We appreciate that. And thank you. Thank you, very <laughs> much for, thank you very much for your willingness <clears throat> to serve on this commission. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay. That's it. Well, actually, give her a round of applause. We'll go <laughs> to the other side. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I didn't call on you earlier. Oh. Thank you. And Ryan, thank you for your patience. Thanks a lot, buddy. So, um, what I'm here to talk to you tonight is about a letter to send to the legislature to support the continuation of uh, solar policies in Massachusetts. As you know, uh, Arlington's been a long supporter, and has a long history of supporting clean energy, uh, whether that's renewable energy or energy efficiency. We have a vibrant solar market uh, in town. Uh, if you go and count the permits on, on the website, there's something on the order of 400 uh, solar power systems that have been permitted in town, including about 700 kilowatts on six schools that went in over the summer. Um, the town has, also, has had great success more broadly as a, as a green community. And um, Massachusetts has uh, fairly strong climate and energy policies. We're ranked in the top five solar states in the country. Um, what's happening right now is we're hitting up against limits related to uh, we call net metering, which is the ability to send power back into the grid if you have solar on your roof or, or elsewhere. And uh, the legislature is currently considering legislation to essentially update our solar policies in Massachusetts, and we're asking uh, the Board of Selectmen to submit a letter to support lifting of what are called net metering caps. So this is the percentage cap based on the peak load of a utility of how much solar they can interconnect uh, with net metering, and we're asking to retain uh, fair value for the energy that gets exported onto the grid from those solar 
uh, in installations. And we're also asking for, in the letter, for the state to start looking at essentially a successor policy to what's called the SREC2 program. This is a, 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 a the, um, the solar credits that, that, um, that can be sold from solar generation. Once the uh, current target of 1,600 megawatts of solar in Massachusetts is reached, that program will end, and we need to start thinking about a policy that's going to come afterwards. So that's the, essentially the contents of the letter, and we're asking you to send that in so the legislature can hear from Arlington. Any questions, motions? Move approval. Move approval. Second. Second. Discussion, Mr. Dunn? I'm afraid I'm going to be a fly in the ointment on this one. Uh, I, there are a lot of things in this letter that I agree with. Um, I support, I think that we should be supporting solar power. I think the state legislature, or the state pol energy policy should include solar power. Um, I'm not convinced that there are certain elements of this, in particular things like the full retail price that makes sense. Uh, one of the things that I think that, uh, when it was pointed out to me in an email I got this afternoon, I was already had troubles, but this email really put me over the edge, was things like um, this full retail benefit tends to do things like it, it tends to um, support homeowners at the expense of renters because homeowners have the ability to you know do uh, power much more than a renter does because what we're really talking about when we're talking about the full retail is we're saying you know we're going to subsidize solar to some degree on the backs of other ratepayers or taxpayers or something like that so well I think a more broadly written letter would probably <coughs> have my support the actual specifics in this I'm unfortunately not going to sign on would you want to try to put together a new draft that you could support or? Um, if the board or the proponent felt that something like that was in order, I'm, I'm sure we could get to something that I would agree with. But at the same time, if, the, if we want to, you know, I don't, it's a resolution. You know, there's only so much that we can, the time and energy that's worth <coughs> uh, for us. If, yeah. if, I, if I can just make a suggestion uh, or just respond to that. So there, there's a lot of debate on what the value of solar is. Um, issues of cost shifting between solar customers and non-solar customers, whether they're renters or not. Um, the, the reality today is that the, the um, electricity, electricity system does not fully compensate for all the values that solar brings. So there are values that obviously accrue to the, to the owner of the system, but then there are also benefits that accrue to the system as a result of that uh, solar power being on the system. So currently, the retail rate is the formula that's used. Um, I expect that over time that will evolve. Currently, there is, no, uh, there is no answer yet as to what that will be in Massachusetts. And until that is settled, and that will probably take some doing, um, you know, supporting the current policy, in our view, is what we should be doing. So I'm, I'm I understand his argument, and I am I, I'm unpersuaded. I would like so. For instance, should we say that we should be figuring out what that retail price or what that price should be, and we should be figuring it out? But frankly, the, this con the question about like you know what should be the state energy policy is a little bit above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. uh, do I believe that we should be supporting green energy? Do I believe we should be supporting solar? Yes. Uh, the specific SREC two, the specific retail rates. I do not have any certainty that that's the right policy. I told you I was going to be the fly in the ointment, Mr. Yeah, Peter. yeah, yeah. So tell me how to make you happy, um, so I don't have to swat you. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I mean, I, yep, I, wanted, nope. I, I hear what you're saying. Yep. And would you, I'm, uh, Ryan? Are you okay if he attempts to rewrite or? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I would uh, be happy to, to work on that. Mind doing that, Dan? Would you? Uh, sure. Take this and and I'm, I mean I'm not sure that um, that uh, that he would be satisfied with what I because what I would say would be far more general and related to our past support of green energy and stuff and uh, and be, uh, the green community work and the and the goals that we've adopted as a part of a town like all of those what I would be looking for, what I would propose would probably be more of an echoing of some of the green community work that we've already approved. So, uh, but I don't know if that goes far enough for... It's, it's not quite the same thing, I unfortunately. Yeah. Um, what the letter does say specifically is we want to support full retail rates for small systems. Uh, it doesn't specify what the, what the compensation rate would be for other systems. So it's, it's, um, it's somewhat vague, but I think it's also uh, generally accepted that those are the kinds of systems for which it would make sense to, to retain full retail rate compensation. Okay. So let, let me see what Joe and Steve are, okay? Because I'm willing to sign it as is, but I want to go. Uh, thank you very much. I'm willing to sign it as is, but I'm also willing to wait to see if there's a way to, uh, 
to come to some some agreement on here. I, I've heard you know the cost shifting argument between homeowners and renters also, and I understand that. But I also understand, you know, that hundreds of Arlington residents made costly capital investments in solar systems, especially through our solarized mass uh, push. And part of the financing that they were banking on was predicated on the, the, the system that's in place now for the, the net metering. So if that is to change, you know, we're essentially undoing that financing. And the way I look at this is that, you know, a lot of, you know, hundreds of Arlington homeowners, thousands across the state have made these types of capital investments. And the net effect of this is that the utilities are presumably going to avoid some very costly capital investments on, on, on their own. Whether or not it should be full retail rate or not, I, I don't know, but I'm satisfied that when I look at this, that right now we're, we're looking at hundreds of Arlington households that, that based, based their investments on a particular system and don't want to see the rug ripped out from under them on that. And, and just, just um, to be fair, <clears throat> depending on where the legislators land, whether grandfathering is included or not, I, I'm not sure. So I would expect uh, that grandfathering would be allowed for customers who already have it. But in Nevada, they just voted to uh, deny grandfathering when they gutted their net metering uh, policies. So, Mr. Bell. I like gambling. And, uh, I, um, I, I'm on the same page with uh, you and Joe. Um, and, I, and I do understand um, where Dan's coming from. But I, um, when I think about the Green Communities Act, I, I think it's a, a really great program. But I think now it's time to kind of move beyond that. And I think these are the steps we should take to move beyond it. So. Okay. Thank you, and, and to my favorite fly, uh, this is um, having just me sign it, but I don't know if that matters to you or not, okay? I can count to three. <laughs> I'll be able to sleep well tonight. That, that's what I did. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. So on the motion by Mr. Byrne, seconded by Mr. Curo, all those in favor of um, uh, empowering the chairman to sign this letter, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Okay. Thank you. So three to one, thank you. Uh, Dan, I'm gonna hand this to you because I have to take a break. So just keep going with the meeting if you, you don't sure mind. You want us all to? You want all to, well, I'm, yeah, I'm, wor I'm worried about them out there. Quick five minute break? Yeah, all right, yeah. five minute break. Uh, apologies, I know it's been a long night already, but. Uh, I think a break is often a good move good. for us. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this is a, an agenda item in relation to uh, a program being offered by the uh, Baker administration and also included in the board's uh, goals that were adopted for both the board and the town manager in August of last year. Uh, this is a pretty simple yet exciting program where uh, the governor, uh, the Patrick, uh, excuse me, the Patrick administration, whoa, the, the Baker administration has said, we wanna give an opportunity for uh, communities who are doing a good job to get credit for doing a good job. Uh, so they say if you as a city or town want to commit to a best practice, they will then in turn give you uh, assistance or resources to be able to achieve that best practice. And then once you have uh, signed on to this community compact, you'll get extra points on various state grants, uh, grant applications. So uh, what I've put before the board for endorsement tonight, and if the board endorses it, I'll enter into the community compact system tomorrow. And then after getting approved, the lieutenant governor will come out and we can have a ceremony and sign our community compact, uh, is for uh, the town to uh, complete and adopt a complete streets policy. That's something the board has already favorably acted upon in terms of concept, uh, but we haven't got over the final hurdle of actually approving a complete streets policy. And secondly, having a, uh, performing an IT system vulnerability assessment. Uh, that's something that we could cooperate with Mass IT on. It was a suggestion by the municipal liaison at Mass IT, and when suggested to David Good, he loved the idea. Uh, so by putting both of those in, um, I think it shows a little bit of a, you know, a, a diverse interest in some best practices we can pursue. Uh, it gets us onto the growing list of communities that have uh, joined the Community Compact Cabinet, uh, Community Compact Program, and uh, I know specifically on Complete Streets, by making it a community, a community compact commitment, having it, uh, actually completing it, then you get extra points specifically on the Complete Streets grant program, which I know we'll be applying for. Uh, so happy to answer any questions the board might have. Questions? Mr. Byrne. Um, uh, no, no questions, but I, uh, I just wanna say that I'm very happy we're um, moving forward with this. 
Um, actually, when it was being created, I was I joined in on a few meetings with um, some mayors and other selectmen from around the state and uh, helping to form the community compact. And um, I, I think it is a, a really good initiative by the administration. So thank you very much for um, acting on this. You're welcome. So your motion is? is to move approval. Second. Second discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Uh, vote sponsorship of unconscious bias and stereotypes, Mary Harrison. Um, she's in 2020. Huh? Should we? She's going to say. Anybody here from the Vision 2020 Diversity Task Force? You yeah. want to speak for Mary, or do you want to? Should we? So, should we get a chair? Do you want us to move the mic over to you? <laughs> so, so I can answer your questions. Um, um, although unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sorry. Your name is, sir. Susan? I'm David Lanscove. Okay. And and you're asking the board to to uh, uh, to, to become a sponsor of unconscious bias bias a presentation followed by Q and A on April seventh, and then also with the Arlington Center for the Arts stereotypes the conscious look at race, faith, gender, and orientation, a photography uh, exhibit at the Arlington Center for the Arts, uh, which will be at the Gibbs Gallery from March 7th through April 15th. That's correct. Okay. So. Good by me. Uh, okay. Motion, Mr. Kiro. I, I'll move that we, spo we sponsor it. Okay. Is there a second? Second. second. Discussion? Yeah. Yes, go. I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I think this is, this, this is very consistent with the values this, this board has, has um, espoused. Um, through the years, and it's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, if we look at, we're in good company, the Arlington Council on Aging, the police department, and uh, many other uh, members of the faith community and, and our town government and, and nonprofits. so I'm, I'm proud to, to join with them. I as well. Brother. Okay, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I feel diverse. <laughs> <laughs> you take your time. Thank you. Uh, next, a vote to adopt the Suburban Coalition Resolution regarding the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Tingling with excitement, Mr. Paul Schlichtman, Chair of the Arlington School Committee. Paul, welcome. Thank you, members of the Board of Selectmen. Do you have a copy of the resolution itself? Uh, it has whereases. <laughs> Have I, I don't think it made the uh, novice, but let me give you the actual copy of the resolution. Yeah, I don't think I do. Thank you. I don't. Yes. I think oh. Do. Oh. Thank you, Paul. Oh, right. Yeah, oh, yeah it is. I think we already have them, Paul. Thank you. Oh, is it on the desk? Yeah, it's number, oh, I see. Right. number 15 on the desk. And just the, the supporting data. Yeah. So it's Arlington specific. So the Suburban Coalition has asked school committees, select Board of Selectmen or City Councils and uh, Finance Committees to adopt this resolution pertaining to the uh, full funding of the Foundation Budget uh, Review Commission's recommendations. Bottom line is basically throughout this century, and we're now six, 17 years into it, we're, we're approaching fiscal 17, uh, the Foundation budget has been underinflated uh, it has not kept cost up with the cost envisioned in that reform. Plus, there are new things we have to pay for, such as technology. Uh, so the way the, the state funding formula works is they calculate a foundation budget, calculate the ability to pay for mun uh, a municipality, 
and then the state kicks in the rest. So if you underestimate the cost of providing the education, the municipality still has to contribute. But what happens is the state contribution every year is reduced due to the underinflation of the actual cost. So the Suburban Coalition put together this resolution with uh, four whereas is in a therefore be it resolved. Um, basically, the therefore be it resolved would be that the Arlington Board of Selectmen calls on the Massachusetts legislature and the governor of Massachusetts to fully fund and adopt the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission in the immediate future. The bottom line is here in Arlington, our enrollment has gone up in this fiscal year 1.58%. The foundation budget went up slightly more than that, 1.72%. Our required contribution under the formulas is increased 5.52%, but our chapter 78 has gone up 1%, a 1% increase with a 1.5% increase in population and nothing to adjust for the increased cost. In fact, the way they calculated the foundation budget this year, talk about underinflated, <coughs> they didn't even inflate it, they deflated it by 0.22%. So the foundation budget is less this year than it is the previous fiscal year. And it's unconscionable. When the Foundation Budget Review Commission says, historically, for the past 16 years, we've been underinflating the budget for the governor to come in subsequently, and instead of looking to keep up or make, make up for the progress that the commission advocated for, they actually deflated the, uh, the foundation budget. It's inexcusable. And the school committee adopted this unanimously. We hope you would adopt it, too. Mr. Chaplin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Schlickman. Uh, so I, I think it's important to mention the MMA is fully supportive of the Foundation uh, Budget Review Commission's uh, findings and recommendations. Uh, the only thing I'll, I'll say I'm surprised by is the language requesting full funding and adoption immediately, uh, with the price tag being probably somewhere between four and five hundred million dollars, which is n nothing short of a total impossibility in one fiscal year. The MMA's advocacy has been for a phase-in approach over four years, so a 25, 25, 25, 25. So I'm not suggesting the board not support this, but I think it's important to put out there that um, even, even that's a very difficult financial pill for the state to swallow. Uh, so expecting full implementation in one year is probably a pretty large leap to expect. Oh, I agree. I don't expect full implementation. But when, you, when you're at this point where they're actually deflating the thing, yeah. Action, there is action is needed. It, it is the equal and opposite reaction. I agree. Good. Mr. Kiro. I, I, I move that we approve the resolution as uh, presented to us. Um, go, go okay. Okay. Go okay, go ahead. Um, I, I think it's very important. I mean, we know as we've sat in long range planning committee meetings and we've, we've tried to look out over the coming years and we try to square the increases in enrollment and uh, some of the, the needs of the schools that that, that have lagged as, as we've tried to uh, meet some of those new challenges. And we, we continually look to the state to, to help fill that gap. And I think that when we see some of this, um, you know, <laughs> I think I used the word mismatch uh, earlier tonight. But again, this is a mismatch uh, between our needs. Um, I know from my time on the, the school committee, I mean, continually we, we were looking to the state to, to uh, really look at adequacy of the foundation budget. But budget and um, uh, still not meeting it. And uh, I think it's important that, that communities do come together and show that, that their governing boards are, are working together on this and, and recognize it as a, as a uh, matter of public policy uh, of great urgency for the, the, their communities. Is there a second? Second. Second for the discussion? Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm gonna support this. I do, I do question whether or not it would make sense to send a, you know, a more detailed letter, you know, that actually says why this is important to Arlington as opposed to just signing on to a resolution. But um, I'll, I'll support this either way. Do you have a reaction to that, Paul? I mean, uh, we'd be happy to help you with a letter if you so desire, uh, if the board would like to uh, send a letter in addition, but we would like to report back to the Suburban Coalition or have you do so that the Board of Selectmen has joined us in terms of adopting the resolution. Okay. Mr. Dunn? Uh, towards uh, Steve's concern, one thing, we're 
probably due to have a budget and revenue task force before our town meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably later than we'd like, but at the same time, it is uh, the chance for us to talk about this type of thing in person with our delegation. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I totally agree that th that that's at least a venue for us to make a more nuanced uh, Arlington specific case. Good point, thank you. All right, uh, all those further discussion? All those in favor of the motion by Mr. Kuro, seconded by Mr. Byrne, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you, Paul. I would also be remiss in uh, not thanking the Board of Selectmen for their hospitality in September, October, November, uh, when we were unable to meet at the high school due to the uh, malfunction elevator. Uh, while we waited to get the parts from the uh, curator of the elevator museum, you were very gracious in letting us use the chambers. It was very comfortable. Uh, we enjoyed it. Uh, the, the five of us who got the nice chairs really liked the chairs. <laughs> we have an extra chair tonight. If you oh, <laughs> were you in my? Were you in this chair? Yes. Uh, what's this fifth of scotch? Uh, <laughs> it's no, is that yours? no problem. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Paul, you might want to stick around for just one more item. We're about to talk about Minuteman. It might be interesting to you. And so, the Minuteman Building Project Assessment Task Force, Mr. Dunn. Uh, so, middle of next week, we're going to know whether or not we have a new regional agreement. Uh, we will either have 16 yeses or we won't. And if uh, last I counted, it was there were nine yeses, and there are a bunch of towns voting tonight and tomorrow. Uh, so, we're going to know pretty quick. But so, say the question, say it comes back as no. Our path forward is clear. We don't want to build a building. We don't want to pay for it. It's not fair. Say the, the 16 towns say yes. Then Minuteman is going to be coming forward with a building proposal, and we have to decide whether or not that building pro proposal is something that we want to support. And as I mentioned in our last meeting, we don't really have a mechanism for deciding whether or not a building project is of this type is good because ordinarily it's either coming from the school department in which case there's an advocate and the, the permanent town building committee and the finance committee that's evaluating it or it's coming from the town manager and again the town manager is the advocate and we have a group evaluating it we don't really have that structure for uh, Minuteman so I've been talking about that for a bit and I got some advice some good advice from several people in town in particular Charlie Foskett uh, weighed in with something that made sense uh, there's been a group of Minuteman uh, people that have been sort of like a Minuteman kitchen cabinet that's very immersed in the Minuteman issues. And his suggestion was we'd formalize that group and add a couple more. So the proposed members, and so and I will also say, I'm, uh, I think we should discuss this today and collect feedback from the board. I also want to see if we get any other feedback from the Finance Committee or the Capital Planning Committee or the School Committee, and then uh, take a vote two weeks from now, because at that point we will also know whether or not we have a regional agreement or not, in which case the skull could even be moot. Uh, proposed membership, uh, me, Joe, Al Tosti, uh, Steve DeCourcy, who is the Finance Committee member who, who deals with the Minuteman budget. Um, Charlie Foskett is, of course, the Vice Chair of uh, FinCom and the Capital Planning Committee Chair. Uh, Sue Scheffler, who is the Minuteman School Committee member. Uh, we have a new member of the Minuteman, our designee to the Minuteman School Building Committee, uh, Noaf Kaba who I don't know if he's actually been formally appointed yet, but I know that that's in process, so. Uh, yeah, I'm it, still trying to get my hands on his resume, but we can. Okay, but it, it's that. a, you know, pe the, there, there's a little bit of paper there, but it's still done. Um, Ka Superintendent Kathy Bodie, or her designee, and Minuteman Superintendent Ed, Ed Bequillen, or his designee. Mm -hmm. um, that's, and, oh, and then I also put a little bit of a draft charge. Uh, Arlington holds the education of our children to be one of the most important obligations and priorities. That commitment includes providing high quality vocational education to the students who choose it. As with all town priorities, vocational education must be considered within the constraints of our town's ability and willingness to pay. Towards that end, the task force should consider the proposed Minuteman building project and recommend what actions should be taken. These considerations should include the capital plan, Arlington's public schools, all potential revenue sources, and any other area the task force finds to be useful and relevant. The task force should research and deliberate with appropriate haste such that it can educate, inform, and make recommendations to the relevant committees and boards in preparation for the special town meeting on April 27, 2016. The task force would be disbanded at the conclusion of the regular town meeting of 2016. Um, the only, in, if, if I missed you just saying this, excuse me, but the only, should we have someone from the Permanent Town Building Committee on? That is an interesting question. I saw these, uh, and um, 
it's a good so well they're well, just so knowledgeable about buildings it, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say I want to talk in particular with uh, Charlie and okay. see um, and, and I guess Adam and see what they think about whether or not that's like adding whether that's, that's like adding good things or whether it's just duplicating what's already there but okay. it's a really good idea I, I think we should I, 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 I'm, I might I'm yeah. comfortable it could already be there by the way so yeah yeah Mr. Byrne. No, uh, thank you very much. And, and you know, uh, thank you every time you bring this up. But I think this is a really good idea. Um, the one person that came to my mind when looking at the list, um, just basically due to his resume, and I know that Adam will kind of have to sign off, and it would be Sandy. Because mm. I think um, he has some expertise in, you know, school building and, you know, everything that goes into it from the municipal side. So that, that came to mind, and I know that would be probably a conversation with Adam. But just wanted to throw it out there. Mr. Kiro. Thank you. And um, this did come up at the Long Range Planning Committee, and I think that's where the idea was first floated. The way, I thought <coughs> putting a couple of people on the spot. I mean, the one other person who comes to mind here is sitting right in front of us. And yep. It's Mr. Schlickman, the chair of the school committee, who was also a uh, previous Minuteman school committee member, um, and uh, you know, very familiar with the, the issues there. And I think we, we felt when we discussed this um, that it is important that the Arlington Public Schools have one or two seats at the table in this because we have to start, we do, but we don't always talk about it this way. We, we have to make clear that the Minuteman education, it's part of our overall educational approach to, to our students. And if decisions are gonna be made about the building that has curriculum implications, that has considerations have to be made here at the local level as well. If, if certain programs are not offered at Minuteman, we have students who require those services. How is our local school district going to respond to them? What are the, um, what are the different options and scenarios? I, I would recommend as we think about this, if Mr. Schlickman were to be willing, if we go forward, that, that um, we consider him as, as one of the members okay. as well on this task force. So I, my, well, I'll follow up with chairman of the school committee, chairman of the finance committee, chairman of the capital planning committee, and talk, talk to Adam, take this feedback into consideration. I heard some good ideas, but I didn't hear any table thumping um, musts. And uh, so I guess I'd move then that we table this and, uh, and to consider it again in two weeks. Second. So moved. Second. Oh. Oh, okay, all those in favor, please say it five by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And Dan, thank you for your unbelievable work on this. Warrant article hearings. Thank you, Paul. Article 18, bylaw amendment, expanding equal protection to see if the town will vote to amend Title II, Article 9 of the town bylaws to promote equality by amending the Arlington Human Rights Commission's stated purpose to include additional and more comprehensive protected classes of persons and further to authorize the commission to take action within the scope of its powers to find therein to protect and promote equality for such additional and more comprehensive protected classes of persons or take any action related thereto. Please. Hi, I'm Mel Goldsipe with the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Um, we're very excited about this proposed bylaw change. Um, the group that we're interested specifically in protecting um, with this bylaw change are um, transgender and gender nonconforming people. Um, the current Massachusetts state law is incomplete in providing protect <coughs> protections to this group. Um, they passed protections in 2011 um, regarding uh, education and housing and lending. Um, those sorts of things, but they left out uh, public accommodations, which is everywhere from hospitals to restaurants. It's basically anywhere you go between home and work or school. So that's a lot of places where people are discriminated against, and we want to close that gap. We're hoping that there will be a state law passed this session, but it's not looking great. Um, so I think Arlington really needs to step in um, and provide those missing protections. Um, but also, that even when the state law passes, which will definitely happen in the next three to four years, I just, I think we're moving there. Um, it's still important for Arlington to show that we care about all of our citizens. And um, we already specify a lot of um, at-risk groups in our bylaw, and um, it shows that we care about those groups. And so this one is missing, and we need to add it. Yes. 
Mr. Dunn? Um, I'm persuaded that absolutely this is something we should do. I'm happy to move approval. I, obviously, I want to hear it if anyone else wishes, else wishes to speak, but I can't imagine voting against Second. It. Right. Recommending favorable action, sure. Would anybody else like to speak on this matter? I, I think we are quite unified on this. All those in favor of the motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Curo, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thanks for your excellent work. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank and you. thanks for your patience, all of you, I know. <laughs> But let's keep moving. So Article 19, <laughs> Bylaw Amendment, Arlington Human Rights Commission Executive Director. To see if the town will vote to amend, uh, to amend Title II, Article 9 of the Town Bylaws to modify and clarify the position of Executive Director to the Commission, including the conditions and process of appointment or take any action related thereto. And Article 20 is also tied into this. So. I don't know if you'd like to speak to both or just Article 19. Good evening. This is William Logan from the Human Rights Commission. Uh, basically, what we have proposed is in front of you. Uh, the main change is that we're trying to get it from saying we shall have a dir executive director to we may, because we presently don't have a need for an executive director, but the current bylaw requires us to have one. So uh, as you remember from last year's town meeting, one was trying to be opposed on us even though we didn't need it. Um, also, we're asking that if we do have a uh, executive director, that the town manager appoints it with consultation by the commission. Um, and then uh, the, in the second proposed language, we're asking that the executive director shall be an employee of the town and report to the commission. Since they'll be working for us, we'd like them to report to us. So those are the pro uh, proposed changes. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Dunn. Yeah, actually, I have a question. Yeah, yeah I have a, a question and a comment. So, um, I'll, I'll start first with the question. So, tell me uh, what is the thought, what's the thought behind taking the selectmen out of the approval process? Uh, well, sorry, I almost called you Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> I've never answered to that before. Well, you only have to do that with me. Don't <laughs> Right. Well, uh, the commission, we felt that the person should be working for us um, because the commission eventually might actually have to investigate town employees, and that would be a conflict of interest, and we just felt that it would be better to have a relationship with us. Um, while the selectmen do appoint people to the commission, there's more independent uh, places in there, such as the town manager and the uh, moderator. So we just felt there was kind of a conflict of interest. So we just thought it would be better to have a, the town manager appointment. So. so the thought that uh, sticking with the selectman part of the conversation first, um, one of the things that I was thinking about is that uh, in some ways, when by getting the selectman involved in the appointment, it makes us more invested in who the person is and I'm particularly thinking, like, in this in the situation where everything's boring, everything's boring, and it doesn't matter who did the appointment and what's going on. What I'm particularly concerned about, given, is that sometimes the Arlington Human Rights Commission gets involved in uh, emotional and uh, controversial issues, which I think it does well, but at the same time, they're, they can be tricky. And uh, one of the things, if we are appointing or confirming the appointment of an executive director, you've got us invested in the person and in the organization. And so, uh, for instance, you know, if someone, one can, one can imagine a scenario where the a Human Rights Com Commission do, does something controversial, and the selectman could, at the time, say something along the lines of, well, you know, we have absolutely nothing to do with them. You know, we appoint out only four people. I can't be held responsible for what those crazy people are doing. On the other hand, you could have a board of selectmen that says, well, yeah, oh yeah, I voted for that guy. I approved him. And uh, it really, it, it serves an interesting purpose in that it ties us to your leadership. And so I'm really wondering whether or not uh, that's something you'd necessarily want to be giving up. Well, I think, uh, at least in my opinion, that perhaps you could keep that in there, but add the, with consultation of us, because presently, oh. I talk, the consultation, I think, is that one I'm, I'm not concerned about at all. I am a little bit, I have hesitancy about taking us out of it, the equation. Understood. Um, 
my second, I'm going to keep the uh, second one is we, so we got a memo from town council who said that basically it didn't make sense legally for uh, this town employee to report to anyone except for the town manager. And so he didn't think he was of the opinion that it wasn't going to fly uh, with the, the town manager act as in like a bylaw where this town employee reports to someone who wasn't the town manager mm -hmm. would be in conflict with the uh, with, with the town manager act. I'm inclined to take his advice. <laughs> well, uh, in other towns, for, I mean, cities, excuse me, uh, Somerville, for example, they can file complaints against town employees, yeah. uh, civilian can't, or other employees. So basically having them report to the town manager would be a conflict of interest. So that is why we took that into consideration. Currently, we don't do that. The town is immune from this. But in other places that we looked at, they have that, and that's why we suggested that. I think, unfortunately, for us to do that, should I'm not even I'm not totally sure it's a good idea. But even if we wanted to, we'd have to do it through a home rule petition mm -hmm. to, to change the town manager act. We can't do it on the bylaw level. So, um, I think what I'm coming to, my my current thoughts are that I agree with you the, the with the consultation, agree with you with the May. I'm not sold on the board of selectmen part, uh, but I'm curious what other members and other members of the public think because I'm definitely I'm I'm still tossing and turning on that one. And the reporting to um, the town manager, that one I just don't, I, I'm inclined to take the advice of town council who said it, 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 we'd need to do it through a different method. Thank you for your patience. Mr. Cook. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to say thank you for bringing this forward. I think you'll remember this was a subject of a um, uh, proposed bylaw change last year, town meeting, which unfortunately became unnecessarily divisive, I think. The commission committed to go back and take a look at it and come back to us with recommendations, and you've done that. You've followed through on your, your commitment, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I have the same concern with Dan as far as the, the Town Manager Act, the conflict there, and I'm not sure that we can really get around that. I, I, I know you can always be colored by the, um, your views can always be colored by who's sitting in the chair right now. I feel pretty confident that, that with this manager right now working in consultation with the commission, we'd be in, in good hands if there were um, uh, complaints filed against town employees. But I, I recognize why uh, you sought to do that. I, I actually, I'm agnostic on the, 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 ver the, um, the question of whether or not the Board of Selectmen should be part of, of that or not, although I, I do see the argument that it could actually be a benefit, I think, to the, the commission to have the, the, the board um, invested in that way. Um, so that might be worth some more, you know, thought and, and uh, conversation on, on your part. I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic on that from my perspective. I don't feel a need to do that, but I could see where it could be helpful to the commission. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think I, I am kind of aligned with where Joe is going. Um, I really, I, I don't feel terribly strongly. I wouldn't mind hearing from a few others if there are people willing to, you know, have a few more arguments for it. But, but if not, I'd be happy to support Joe's, uh, you know, where Joe's going. Mr. Chapter Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the only points I would make, um, you know, this being a potentially paid employee <laughs> of the town, I think it would be the only, if it was to go in um, the way that the town council has currently worded it, and, but then we added in some kind of board ratification or approval, I think it would be the only paid employee that the town manager employs, um, employs or hires that the board then has to ratify. So it would create, in that regard, it would create a unique situation. Hmm. The deputy treasurer would be a similar situation, but that's actually not under the manager's jurisdiction. That's a statutory requirement. Um, so I'm not saying that in opposition, but just pointing out that I don't know that it happens. I, we, I could look a little closer, but I don't know that it happens anywhere else. And, and just to, to back up what uh, both Mr. Dunn and Mr. Cure were, were mentioning, uh, as town council mentioned, it, it, it creates not only the legal problem with the Manager Act, but even then just sort of a practical problem of if the town manager appoints, but then the person doesn't report to, there's sort of an accountability problem there. Um, so I would have no, um, I mean, I think it's quite obvious to me that this person would be appointed to serve the commission um, if we chose to fill the position, but it might seem a little funny if they are hired by one person, but then report to another. But we, again, we can talk through that more. Anybody else here wishing to speak on this matter? Where would we like to go, gentlemen? Mr. Hero. Well, um, I'm, 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 I'm persuaded in particular by the fact 
um, that it would just be such a unique uh, approval process. Uh, in so I, I, I move favorable action, but with that change that, that, that the uh, executive director would actually report to the town uh, manager. Okay. But, uh, and, um, and, yeah, not having the board of selectmen involved in the board. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Fly? Uh, I'm good. You good? I used, okay. my, I used my fly card earlier. <laughs> Mr. Logan, you okay on this? Uh, yes, that's with the, the part with the consultation with, with, by the commission, yes. Yes. Yep. Yes, thank you. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you, Bill. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Um, article, which one am I on? Article 21. Oh, the Arlington Commit... 20? 20. 20. 20, excuse me. Oh, Human Rights Commission Chairperson, excuse me. See if the town will vote to amend Article 2, uh, Title 2, Chapter, Article 9 of the Town Bylaws, Section 3, E1, Executive Director, Officers Quorum and Adoption of Rules and Regulations to read. The commission shall elect a chairperson or two co-chairpersons from among its members at the first meeting of every year or take any action related thereto. Hi, Mel Goldsythe again. Um, can I just interject one thing I forgot to say before the last one? Um, since, I don't know, people might be watching. Millions. The, the <laughs> millions. Um, the Arlington Human Rights Commission is currently doing a survey of the LGBTQIA community, and uh, there's a link to that on our website. We also have a commission opening, and there's information about that on our website as well. So if you're interested, please look into both of those things. Okay. okay, thank you. Sure. And then um, about this matter at hand, there's, uh, we've had two openings for a really long time. Mm -hmm. One it has recently been filled and one will be filled shortly, but um, it became an extra amount of work during those two openings um, that the chair was just filling it, was basically doing the work of three people. Um, but even when we have a full commission, it's still a lot of work for one person and we would like to have the option that if it becomes too burdensome from one person, that we could split the work among two. Should move approval. Move approval. Second. Second. Further discussion? Yeah, Joe. As one who has served as the chair of the Human Rights Commission, I, I uh, fully support what Mel has, has said, and um, I, I think it's, it's a no-brainer. We have other committees and commissions that do. I think we're about to hear from one in a Great. few moments. We'll do the same. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you. And Christine has done a great job for us taking on all that extra work. I just wanted to say that. Do you want to give a speech, Christine? Or? <laughs> <laughs> she loves the mic, I know. <laughs> okay, so uh, now 21. Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture uh, membership to see if the town will vote to amend Title II, Article Eight of the Town Bylaws to increase the number of members of the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture from seven to nine or take any action related thereto. Welcome. Hello. Hello. I'm Hello. Stephanie Marlin Curiel, Barbara Costa, yeah. co-chairs of Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture. Okay. Do you ask us questions or do we... Um, Probably see both of the above, Barbara. But if you would like to say anything first, or what? What? I, I, I mean, I will say it's unusual for commissions to want to go from seven to nine, uh, and it's because you have that great an interest, I assume. Well, we um, hope we will fill that the nine seats. We know we have a need for it, okay. um, and we do have somebody. Um, I think at least one person interested. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Well, for the rationale. I guess I'll I'll just say since we're in public, we're speaking in front of an audience, um, that we're working on two very substantial projects for the town this year. Um, one is the cultural district designation from the MCC. The other one is a cultural plan um, that we hope to be embarking on soon. These are really big projects, and they are part of our our charge, our bylaw says that we should come up with a you know, long-term cultural plan for the town. So we're working on that, but it's been a lot of work um, with research and networking with other committees and work, and it seems like we attend a lot of other meetings other than our owns and our own and we have um, you know, been writing letters and, and doing a lot of work and it just, um, 
We have a lot of very highly qualified people on the commission who are serving in multiple capacities and run their own businesses and things. And so um, it would help if we had more able hands to uh, take part. And also in a, when someone can't make a meeting or two people can't make a meeting, we feel a little thin. I've been on other committees that are beefier and it just, it would just help to be a little bit more filled out, I suppose. Okay. No. Yes, Mr. Kiro. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Uh, I'm happy to move I'm happy to go in favor. I also wonder if there's um, something tr interesting to do with the language to just make it optional about going to nine. Because yeah. we have some committees that have uh, functions that uh, like have a floating number and it's and uh, like we could cap like list it as a max of nine. So. Uh, any language, so I'm perfectly happy to say shall be nine, mm -hmm. but I'm also happy to say up to nine, and uh, I'd leave that. I think yeah. I'd, I think I'd send that to town council and say, hey, town council, do you want to? What can you draft given that what we've written as our Warren article? So up to nine, yes, okay. Really? Yeah, I'll uh, further Chairman. discussion. Oh, Mr. Chapter Lane. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One point that I know town council and I had discussed, and we didn't achieve clarity before preparation for the agenda was in the appointing structure as it currently exists there's six members appointed by the town manager one of those six has to be a member of vision 2020's culture and recreation task group and then the seventh member is appointed by the school committee so I, I didn't know if you had any thoughts on how you would want those two additional members appointed mm -hmm. well we um I, first of all i wasn't sure if the vision 2020 um involvement was continuous or just in the initial um, makeup, but I like the idea of continuing that, and I, I think we had suggested eight, um, we'd go with eight appointed by town manager and one by school committee. All right, so the two would be added to the town Two manager. added to the, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, Mr. Curo. Thank you. To Mr. Chaplin's point, I think it would better just leave it open-ended and leave it to your discretion to try to, I know you'll try to find that type of representation, especially with the changes we made to Vision 2020 last year where the, the task groups aren't actually written right into the Vision 2020 um, bylaw. They're created on an as-needed basis so we could get into this funky area. Uh, but I, I will just throw in a pitch that, you know, Stephanie and Barbara worked very hard. Um, the the initiative they're, they're heading up on the cultural district involves a big um, uh, public um, engagement process. March 30th, I know, is going to be the big uh, public meeting for the cultural district initiative. So uh, very happy to try to help give them extra hands going forward. Okay. Thank you, um, Joe, for your involvement on that as well. And thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So on the motion by Mr. Uh, Kiro, seconded by Mr. Byrne. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. So you two are, are veterans. So you know what will happen now is the um, our town council will draw up the final wording and we'll actually, uh, you know, that'll change the up to nine and the other uh, issues as well. So should I follow up with uh, town council or will you do that? Uh, we'll do that. Okay. Yeah, we, we will do that. Great. But, okay? Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much. Thanks. Go watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> we sell them outside this note. <laughs> Uh, Article 25, demolition by neglect of historic buildings. Um, the uh, sponsor of this has asked us to, has asked to withdraw this, so a motion of no action, please. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And uh, the last one, authorizing community choice aggregation. To see if the town will authorize the Board of Selectmen to commence a community choice aggregation program. And, in contract for electric supply as authorized by Mass General Law 164, Section 134, and through CCA, decrease greenhouse gas em em emissions from the generation of electricity for Arlington residents and businesses by pursuing an increased amount of Class I designated renewable energy than is required by the Massachusetts Renewable Portfolio Standard or to take any other action relative there to inserted by our excellent town manager mr chapter lane right that's correct <clears throat> so the uh the proponents uh who worked with but, uh, what, why did you hesitate on the excellent part that i said i, uh, I, I no, I, I wasn't sure if you were <laughs> just i, I wasn't sure where you were pause. headed with the uh, no no sorry <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if it was a, 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 a request to speak or what was uh, <laughs> I know, I know. What was happening. Sorry. 
Uh, so uh, this article was filed uh, by me as town manager uh, at the request of the Energy Working Group, um, uh, Mothers Out Front, Sustainable Arlington, wanting to give uh, the Arlington community opportunity to consider whether or not they wanted to pursue aggregation. Uh, so with this, um, the, the board's already heard a presentation on this in January, but a quick rundown as provided uh, in town council's memo would be uh, really this kicks off with a vote by town meeting to authorize the community to move forward with a CCA or community choice aggregation. Uh, then uh, the town would have an opportunity to either issue an RFP for an aggregator or a broker or we could utilize the MAP, uh, MAPC RFP that we were a part of and sign on with a broker. Uh, so there is a broker identified through an MAPC competitive or collective procurement that we were part of. It's good energy. Um, my intention would not be to sign on until town meeting deliberated and voted favorably on a CCA. Uh, simultaneously, uh, we can begin work on developing a CCA plan uh, that would need to go uh, be done cooperatively with the DOER, the Department of Energy Resources, uh, and then approved by both myself uh, and the Board of Selectmen before issuing, uh, submitting that to um, the DPU. Uh, we would do a public hearing here locally. DPU would do a public hearing on it. Um, if they approved it, we'd then be able to issue an RFP for competitive suppliers. Uh, we could, if satisfied, select a competitive supplier, uh, and then notify everybody in the community who's eligible, which is just about everybody, um, uh, of their inclusion in this aggregation plan, and then residents would have 30 days to opt out if they chose to. So I think there's been a lot of dialogue about whether or not the town should be involved in this. Uh, and I think it's a, valid, it's a valid question because there's no town financial benefit. The town government does not receive any benefit from this. We, as a town, purchase our energy bulk ourselves, so we wouldn't be buying energy through this. But it is a means that's allowed via state statute, and it's a means that a number of other communities have utilized uh, really on two fronts, to A, save ratepayers uh, money by getting a more competitive supply, and B, which is definitely the main thrust of what Mothers Out Front is trying to do is buy a larger portion of renewable energy than you would otherwise be able to do through the market. So, um, you know, I, I've put this forward. I think it's very much worthy of consideration, uh, but I would also understand if the town decides that this isn't the business that we want the town to be in and that there are other uh, avenues by which a, a resident could pursue this. So um, with that, I know that town council has put forward a recommended vote of the board. Uh, but, you know, happy to answer any of the questions the board might have about it. Mr. Bird? Um, I'll uh, move favorable action on, on this. Or is it Second. Move approval? Yeah, move favorable action. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm going to do it for um, one main reason. Um, well, actually, a couple. Cause we actually, we've debated this uh, a couple times. And one, I, I really like that it is a choice. Um, I think that's very important. We're not forcing anyone, anything down anyone's throat here. But two, I think when we, like say earlier, we were looking at, you know, what's the proper state energy policy? And I think, you know, bringing that down to the municipal level, we have to see, you know, I think there are, are really limited options that, you know, towns can take on um, in the, to reduce greenhouse gases as a community. And I think this is one of the main ones moving forward. So I, I think it's an important endeavor, so I'm happy to support it. Is there a second? Second. Mm -hmm. Discussion? Yep, Mr. Dunn. Uh, just so I'm, I'm going to support. I will say that I got some feedback this week that um, there's concern about the first point about the saving money, uh, that there wasn't enough example of that actually happening, and I definitely didn't have the facts available at my fingertips. So I don't know if uh, we can encourage uh, mothers up front to do the some of the to uh, demonstrate some of the examples of the other towns and the experience that they've actually had in terms of their rates to uh, demonstrate, the, you know, the, prove the point one way or another. So yeah, no, that, that, that's an absolutely necessary thing. The, okay. the snapshots I've seen, and it's not many, have shown savings. Yeah. The problem is you lock in for 6, 12, 18 months under this plan, and you could save for 6 months, 12 months, and then the market shifts and you're not saving. So there's definitely okay. risk involved. So seeing how somebody who's been in this for a little while performed against the market for the full duration of an aggregation is probably worth looking at too. Okay, I don't. I don't know if we can. Um, it seems like before town meeting, that would be. I think that would be an important piece of information for us to be able to provide. Okay. Did you say? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to hearing the, the testimony. I, I mean, I'll, I'll 
I think at our last um, presentation on this, I mean, I'm very favorably disposed to it, towards it. I went to a follow-up um, uh, information session, and uh, you know, I'll just repeat the, the, the what I equate it to is sitting here as a board member, how frustrated I feel when we have these cable TV uh, negotiations, and we, we, you know, every 10 years we have to renew the contracts, and we can't impact rates, and we can't impact the choices that that, that the consumers have. You know, all we can talk about is, you know, basically, is are they going to be allowed to do business in the town, and is there a, a share of, of, of funds off of that contract, and where, where does it go? That this actually does allow us to do something with the utilities that will give the consumers a concrete choice, and if they don't want it, they they certainly can choose otherwise. That that are, thank you. Anybody wishing to speak on this matter, Mr. Loretti? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. I'm going to take the uh, contrary view and ask that you pass on this. Not necessarily because the, I disagree with the benefits or, or anything like that, but I think it's, it's unnecessary. And I think um, some of the information that out, that's been put out there perhaps isn't entirely correct. And one is that you need aggregation to get the lower rates and the environmental benefits. And in fact, neither of those is true. Um, you know, there, there's quite a few competitive electricity suppliers out there um, that people can choose from now. It's not simply a matter of staying with Eversource or going to the aggregator. And the interesting thing I found in looking into this a little bit more is that the um, broker that was referred to for MAPC covers a lot of communities in Massachusetts. And I think in every case, or almost every case, they use uh, Con Ed solutions for their provider. Um, any of us who are on Eversource right now can go to Con Ed Solutions, their website, and get the same product that is being offered to cities and towns through the CCA. So you, so you don't have to have this program. The town doesn't have to get involved and you know, use all the staff time and involvement to, um, to, get, you know, to, get, to get these benefits. And if I could, I'd like to provide a, um, some papers to the town manager. Um, in, in one case, for example, um, if I, if, if someone were to go to the website, they could get um, a, a renewable portion of 21% of their electricity. The proponents were talking on the order of 15 to 16%, so it's actually better um, what you could do on your own. And the price would be comparable to what people in Dedham are paying through their CCA. Um, Natick has a CCA. They are about 19% renewable. Now, the interesting thing there, and I think this is something you should pay very close attention to, is that their CCA is now charging more than Eversource. And so if you go to the town website, they tell you how to opt out of the program that they sign the people up for. I don't think your board wants to be in that position you know, a year from now. Um, so it's not, in most cases, I think the, the average cost is better, but, but it's not always the case, and that's a risk. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that when you switch the rate, you're switching to a fixed rate. And it seemed to me that actually the summer rates that Eversource charges may be less than <laughs> what the aggregators are charging, you know, what this program's charging. So while over the course of the year you might save money, if most of your electricity demand is in the summer, if you go away for the winter, you could actually be paying more, um, even though if on average the, the price is lower. And then finally, I think the, um, what perhaps hasn't been fully explored is just the, the level of effort of town staff. Um, the um, MMA, it's, I'm sorry, not the MMA, the uh, MAPC, you know, pointed out that it this does take some effort on the staff's part. They're going to have to monitor the broker. Uh, they're going to have to deal with the public, and they'll have to renew and, and sign the contracts. And so they're, um, that, that's another thing to consider. So I guess for those reasons, I would suggest that this probably isn't something the town needs to get involved with. And if anything, um, the proponents should be looking at more at public information and al alerting you know, uh, citizens to what their options are um, and leaving the town out of it. So if I could, I'd just like to leave these um, sure. things with the town manager. Anybody else wishing to speak on this matter? Um, any any response to that, Adam, or any thoughts? Or no, I I think Mr. Loretti uh, touched on some of the other feedback that I, I have heard. Concern, basically, um, not, not to speak for him, but just a question of whether or not the town should be involved. But I I, I think um, you know town meeting will have that opportunity. You know, you know the board's able to make a choice in what it wants to recommend, and then town meeting will have the opportunity to deliberate on whether or not it is appropriate for the town. So I, I think they're very fair points, um, but I don't know that I feel like 
that it means that it's not worthy of consideration. Okay. So do I have a motion? Yep. Yes. Yep. Who made that motion? I did. Steve and I took a second. Was it was an excellent motion. It, at was. That. it changed my life, Steve. <laughs> so recommending favorable action. Yes. Uh, appreciate the points Mr. Loretti makes, but the, uh, the argument of let's put it in front of town meeting and have a uh, comprehensive discussion there makes sense to me. So all those in favor of the recommended favorable action, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, uh, correspondence received. Motion to accept to to, uh, to bronze and to place in a frame uh, inside this office or anything <laughs> like that, or I just receive. I, I think I'll just I can just bask in the glow. That'll be sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor of receipt, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. New business. Marie Kripelka. Thursday Anything night. happen on Tuesday that you want to talk about? That's a week from Tuesday. That's a week from Tuesday, right, right. right. Yeah. I expect to see you all at 7 o'clock in the morning. Okay. All set? No. Mr. Chapter Lane. Uh, one brief piece of new business this Thursday uh, at the American Legion Hall on Mass Ave will be the annual police awards ceremony. Uh, in the Sons of Italy. They changed it. The year I decided to announce it, they changed the location. <laughs> the Sons of Italy. I would have shown up at the wrong Just place. sending you a message, yeah. Adam. <laughs> Sons of Italy. It's a great event every year. Um, great, great stories of some of the, uh, the, you know, the wonderful and, and very sometimes dangerous work that our uh, police officers do. So uh, I hope, um, you know, some of the board members can attend. I, I look forward to attending. Thank you. Mr. Byrne. Um, no new business, actually. I'll, I have a couple meetings tomorrow, but I'll hit on them next time. Thank you. Mr. Carroll? No new business. Mr. Dunn. Nothing. Mr. Grilly, nothing. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, next meeting of the Islands and Board of Selectmen will be on March 7th. Uh, second to adjourning. Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Good night, all. Thank you for your patience.